Hello. <laughs> um, hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Olivia Jack, um, and I'm going to be talking right now about Hydra, um, which is a tool that I built starting six years ago. Um, and now it sort of has a community who, of people who like to use it and hack it and build it into new things. Um, Sarah over there, um, Sarah GHP is gonna also be helping with the Hydra uh, part of the workshop. And Sarah is also a programmer and artist and visualist and multi-talented artist who uses Hydra as well. Um, and yeah, yesterday we all talked, all of us here talked about our work and a bit about this whole thing called live coding, which is sort of writing code in real time to make audio and visuals. Um, and I'm gonna be introducing Hydra for the next two hours. Um, it's gonna be very hands-on, so um, I'll show a little something and then encourage you to try it out and then show a little something else and then encourage you to try it out um, later. Uh, yeah, and then if you have any questions, I think this is quite a big group, so it might be easiest to direct questions towards Sarah or like, I don't know if raising your hand is awkward. Oh, and also Kate Sikio, who's here. Um, uh, yeah. Any, any questions about that process? <laughs> um, okay, so for the workshop, um, I set up this pad here. Uh, and as I show stuff, I'm going to be putting the links into the, the pad so you can also refer to the past things that we share. And also, um, if you make a sketch you're, you, that you really like, you're also encouraged to share it in the pad and then I can show it up here to everybody. Um, I'll show you in a sec what that actually means. Um, and so, yes, the only URL you need to actually type in is this this one, which is the URL to this um, collaborative pad that's right here. Um, and so hopefully, I saw most people had a chance to do this already. Um, and then we're gonna go straight to the Hydra editor, which is here. Um, and Hydra is a let me read it, a live codable video synth and coding environment that runs directly in the browser. Um, and so we will see what that means. But um, uh, yeah, this is, this is the browser um, and uh, this is Hydra. <laughs> um, and if you close this window that appears, basically, um, you see some text and some visuals behind it. And so this text that's here is generating the visuals that's behind it. Um, yeah, and this it's totally fine whatever your coding background is. Um, we will explain everything kind of step by step. Um, so if you click this shuffle button up here, basically it will load different code that's generating different visuals uh, behind it. And um, yeah, one way of using Hydra is to just kind of shuffle through and find something that you kind of like. I'm gonna like, I'm gonna, I'll go to this one. This one happens to be mouse reactive. Um, and what I could do right now is just uh, pick any number, and the numbers are all in purple, and just change the number. So I'm gonna change this six to a 60, and then press this like run button up here, and something changed. Um, and so I could try changing different numbers and, and see what happens. And there's no wrong number. Um, like you can put really big numbers or negative numbers. Uh, there is some limit at which the computer doesn't understand things as numbers, but that's really hard to get to. Um, so go ahead and open up Hydra Editor. Um, 
close the window and uh, shuffle between things and then try changing a number and then pressing this triangle, triangle run button. If anyone has not been able to open the editor and has not been able to change numbers, um, like make a gesture. <laughs> 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 you came to the right place if you <laughs> like psychedelic visuals. <laughs> Okay, has everyone been able to change some things? What kinds of things were you able to change? Just feel free to share. Ah, uh, cool. Yeah, um, we'll go into what modulation means in a bit, but it's one of the most magical hydro functions, I think. Um, cool, I'm seeing some um, very colorful things on the screen. And before we get too deep, I want to um, back up a little and explain how things work. Um, but just to re-emphasize that this is a totally um, acceptable and encouraged way of using hydra is just changing numbers and seeing what happens. Um, and I think sometimes with coding, there's this idea that you're supposed to start with a blank screen and like memorize a bunch of stuff and then like be sitting at a terminal and typing things from scratch. And it, um, that's sort of a myth in that there's no such thing as from scratch in, in software. Like everything is built on software and code that other people has built. So uh, anytime anyone is writing code, they're kind of depending on a lot of code that already exists. Um, and so uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear the editor by clicking this trash can. And so now I have a blank screen. Um, and I do want to explain a little bit how things in Hydra work. Um, so Hydra is inspired by analog modular synthesis. And so um, it, I guess it's helpful to Ha it, it can be helpful to have this sort of image in your head when I'm talking about how it works. Does anyone know, is anyone familiar with this like actual machine that's here? Cool, and what's it called? The yeah, yeah, so it's been like, I have never actually seen one in person, but next week I get to go to the Art Institute of Chicago where this was originally made in the 70s. That's um, called the Sandine Image Processor. Um, that's a modular video synthesizer, I think first made in 1971 by Dan Sandine. And it works quite similarly to modular audio synthesizers as well. Um, where the basic idea here is that there's all these boxes that are the same size 
and each box either generates a signal, which is like changing a voltage in time, or it modifies an existing signal. Um, and when the signal gets to the screen, basically it's read across horizontally. Um, and so this thing that's like a voltage changing in time becomes a pattern across the screen. Um, and it's very similar to with modular audio synthesis, this voltage change over time, when it gets to a speaker, it turns into um, basically speaker vibration, which uh, pushes air and becomes sound. Um, but in the screen, it's read across the screen like this. Um, and what Dan Sandin and other people making modular synthesizers said about this is basically a goal is to design the modules to maximize the possibilities of interconnecting them. Um, and so the idea is to think about each module in a way that it has the most ways that you could connect it with other things. Um, and so basically, yeah, these cables are connecting different parts of the modules together and then um, some generate signals that change the other signals and when it gets to the screen, it, it makes this pattern. And so it's helpful to just like keep this image in your mind a little bit as we go back to code. I think often like software has metaphors from like prior existing things, like it could be a canvas that you draw on, or it could be um, like a word document, like thinking about things like a typewriter with a piece of paper and text on the paper, or like slides that come from like analog slides, um, which is all to say like these are all like kind of mental models that people have created when they're creating software. And so in Hydra, there's this kind of a bit of this mental model as we approach it. So anyways, back to the code editor. Um, we can create one of these um, modules by typing OSC with parentheses after it. And so OSC, um, is how to create an oscillator in Hydra, which is one of the basic kind of elements of this video synthesis world. So what happens if I type OSC and I press um, this triangle button is that nothing happens. Um, and the reason is that it's like I've kind of made one of these modules, but I haven't connected it to the screen or connected it to the output. And so in order to connect it to the output, I have to add at the end of that dot out and add a parenthesis after. And then I will press this triangle again. And now, woo, there's stripes, um, <laughs> which is the oscillator. I'll just get rid of this also. Um, and so, um, and then in parentheses, what I can start to do is change different parameters of the oscillator. Um, and so here I made it change the frequency or change the number of stripes on it so I could make it bigger or smaller. Um, there's a second parameter that's how fast it's moving. And a last parameter that's how colorful it is. Um, and you can think about um, the numbers that are here is sort of like the knobs that you can turn. And so, the oscillator with the parentheses is like a module that does a thing. Here, it's generating a signal. And the, um, the numbers are like the knobs that you could change um, in that module. And then this dot out is like connecting it to the screen so that you see it. Um, and so now comes the fun part, which is we have a gener like something that's generating the signal. And now we can add a bunch of things in the middle to start um, changing that signal. And so, for example, after the oscillator, I could add uh, rotate. Um, and so now it's starting to rotate. I could add um, kaleidoscope, which is like this. And so now there's a collet. Now it starts to be a kaleidoscope. I could uh, repeat this. And now it starts to repeat. Um, so out always has to be last. Otherwise, you won't see 
um, what happens. Um, otherwise, the order does matter because it's like if I rotate it before I repeat it, it's different than if I repeat it before. Um, you can actually, I think a good way is just to try it. Maybe you've tried changing the order of things. Um, so I just want to show one other thing. So basically, uh, actually, I'll leave this on the screen and let you make this and try changing some of the numbers. And then I'll show you kind of where you can find the list of other functions that are available. It, it doesn't work? I think it's like... Yeah, you don't, so you don't have to put a number. When you don't put a number, it has a default kind of value that it's using. Um, it, yeah. Yeah, feel free to just shout out questions. Is there a yeah, so control, shift, and enter is. To st what? Um, it's kind of just going. Um, yeah, is it is it like bothering? Is the flashing bothering you, kind of, or? Mm. Yeah, this is something. Wait, what did you say? Oh yeah. Um, you could do. Uh, so if you do speed equals zero, just on its own line, then it will stop uh, moving. But, but don't. Um, this sounds like an advanced question. This is yeah yeah no no no. But this is a great question. What do you mean by index by? Yeah, there's, I'll point you to like where to do that, but it's, <laughs> yeah, okay. So before we get down into more advanced topics, I want to kind of keep us on the same page a little bit here and show, basically I'm going to show a few more things, which is where to find information about more functions. Um, and then uh, I'll give you a bit of time to play around with this, and then we'll keep going. So yeah, a little bit of the structure. I'm going to show you this kind of basic way to make a function chain or pattern in Hydra. And then we'll have a little bit of time to play around. And then I'll show you kind of how to blend different things together and also use sources like cameras and videos. Um, so. Um, First, um, I just want to show one thing. So when I hit this play button, or another way of doing the same thing as play is doing control shift enter, what happens is actually you'll see if I change the code and I do it again, um, actually the URL changed. And so what it's doing is it's encoding whatever's in the editor into the URL. And so if I copy this URL and I open it again and I open it elsewhere, basically it will open the exact same sketch. So anything that you make, you can save it and share it basically by saving the URL. Oh, wow. uh, and so you can also then use the browser back to, to go back to your past sketches as well. So like here, we could go back to what I was doing before by using the... Um, 
Exactly. And then, so um, what I can also do now is I'll share this um, in the pad. So here is um, oscillator. I forgot how to spell that somehow. Okay. So, oh, I guess it didn't copy very well. Let's try this again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so as we're making stuff, if you make something you really like, um, you can post the sketch here also. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is um, I just want to show quickly uh, ways of, if say you're trying to type something and you can't, like nothing's happening or it seems like it's not working, so uh, one thing, like let's say instead of typing oscillator, I tried typing Olivia and I tried running it. And so Olivia is not a function in Hydra. I'm not yet that narcissistic, about the thing, but yet. So um, you'll see this thing down here in red. And so the computer is saying Olivia is not defined. And so that's the computer trying to tell me that it didn't understand something that I tried to type. Um, and also, yeah, one question that comes up some is like, why, why does this function exist and not this other function? Or why, like when I type oscillator, does it work this way and not this other way? And the answer is just that that's how I made it when I first made it and then um, I haven't wanted to change it too much since then because I don't want to mess people up. And I just mentioned that because all software at some point, somebody just decided to make the thing work the way that it works. And there's no kind of like um, divine rules about how software is supposed to be. And so you'll see, for example, like when I have an oscillator, here I'll just make it with less stuff. So when I have an oscillator and I put like 20, there's not 20 lines across the screen, there's like three. Um, and I don't remember why it's like that, but that's just, it is that way because it is that way. Um, <laughs> but later we'll see actually how you could like write your functions or change the functions and stuff. Um, but anyways, so uh, if something's not working, check this thing at the bottom to see if there's a red uh, error message from the computer. Um, and, um, yeah, what we've sh seen so far is you start with a, a generator function and then you can keep adding things um, after it. Um, and um, you might wonder kind of like, oh, which, which possibilities are there for things that I can add? And so um, the best way to see that is um, in the question mark kind of help pop up, there's this link that says a list of Hydra functions. And I'll also put this into the, um, uh, here, list of Hydra functions. Spelling wrong, okay. So list of Hydra functions. And so here, um, there's these different um, options on the left. Um, and so you'll see that OSC, the one we used already, is in a source function. And so basically in Hydra, um, you always have to start with the source. So these are kind of possibilities for that. Um, and then after comes all these other things. But for now, I'm gonna stop talking for a bit because I've been kind of like sharing a lot of information at once. So what I would like you to do is try out picking any of these four source functions and then adding geometry and color functions after it and then putting the out at the end to make an out. So for example, um, here's one called noise um, and I could go back to the editor. I'll like start over. Um, I know I'm going a bit fast here, but we'll, we'll like, I'll stop for a sec, so. I'm gonna do noise.out, and now you can see that I um, 
see the noise. And then um, I could pick another one of these. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll do pixelate after it. Oops, I keep doing so. I could do pixelate. Um, yeah, so the basic idea is start with the source function and then uh, use these geometry and color functions after it and see what, what you can make. Um, any questions just about this? I know I'm going a bit fast. Like, it's like writing stuff directly to the GPU. So it oscillate in the context of the computer, not the analog video synthesizer, is outputting color to the screen. And actually, this is a good segue. When we talk about shaders, um, we'll like learn a bit more how the graphics card works um, in, in Shar's workshop, probably. But, but yeah, that's a good, like, that's a good question. Like, I think it's just always work, the rotate is always working from the center of the screen. Um, yeah. So if you wanted to rotate around a different point, you could, like, use scroll to move it and then rotate and then scroll back. Um, but that's, like, this feels like advanced, advanced questions also. But, it, yeah. Um, uh Like in um, like there's no where where are you using zero zero? Is that what uh, okay. I think um, I actually can't remember exactly. I think it goes negative one to one internally. But that's only more relevant if you're, because in Hydra you could write your own GLSL, and it's more relevant for doing that, I think. But I think zero, zero is in the middle. Um, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, so um, when you click on the function here, so for OSC, for example, the default parameters are up here in the usage. Yeah, yeah, those are the, I don't know why it offset doesn't, I think offset is zero, um, but um, yeah, so when you don't include any parameters, it defaults to what is written here. Is every, has everyone been able to like uh, choose a function and put it in the editor and make something happen?
Like, you mean if you have multiple sources and multiple... Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we'll get, we'll get to that, yeah. There's like different ways of thinking about it. I'm just not looking at the ground as I'm walking. <laughs> um, okay, so next, I'm gonna show how to use webcam or video sources in Hydra. Um, and again, like this, at the end of the day, we'll have a lot more chance to just play around. So I am going kind of fast, sh showing a lot of things so you get a basic idea of how everything works. And we, I will keep sharing the code um, here of the things that I'm sharing. Um, so, uh, so far we saw um, the oscillator and we saw this kind of uh, list of other sources. And these sources are all generated within Hydra. Um, and so they're kind of, you know, colorful patterns and stuff like shape is another one we didn't see yet, but it's very useful to make polygons. Um, and so in Hydra, you can also use external sources um, in a bit, I think because of these video synthesis inspirations, like from the beginning, it was really important to me that you can kind of connect lots of video sources together. Um, and, and this makes it um, easier to play along with other things. So you can do like a, a, a screen capture or a webcam or a yeah, uh, even a live stream and this kind of thing into Hydra. And so I keep doing this, but anyways, so I'm gonna get rid of what's on the screen and um, I'm going to initialize the webcam using this uh, syntax, which I will explain. Uh, so uh, if I just run this, which is s0 dot init cam, um, it's asking me to use the camera um, and so I typed this and I did init cam. And so I saw the, the light on my screen turn on, but I don't see anything on the screen. And so again, this is because it's basically like I kind of turned on the camera, I put it on the desk, but I haven't connected it to anything. And so in order to connect it to something, I need it to kind of like integrate it within this chain of things that we were doing up until this point. And so there's a function um, similar to OSC, but it's called SRC for source. And so source, what I'm gonna do is in parentheses put S0. Um, and S0 corresponds to this particular source of this camera that I'm using. And then just like we were doing before, I'm gonna do dot out. And I'm gonna run this again, and ooh, we already have feedback going. This is great. Ooh. Um, um, yay! So, yeah, and so actually we're gonna, if there's time, I'll talk more about feedback because it's one of the, um, one of the things that's kind of really, um, I really like about both analog video synthesis and then that I like doing with Hydra is creating feedback, um, which is kind of when the 
output becomes the input and you get this like infinite mirror effect. Um, and so just like um, we were applying transformations to the oscillator before, um, now I can also apply transformations to this camera. So for example, actually because there's this nice feedback going on, I'm gonna try inverting it. This could be a little flashy, so if you're sensitive to flashes, um, just be aware of that. So, okay. So now I got this really nice, um, th so if you do this, you won't get this nice feedback effect because you don't have a projector behind you. Um, however, I will show you how to do this. <laughs> what? Oh yeah, if you, well, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I could just like with the, um, also if I do this, we could do, ooh, no, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you can, just like we were doing with the oscillator, you can apply different functions to the camera. So like for example, um, now I'm using, uh, I'm changing the color. Um, I could also repeat it like we did before. Um, or do a collect or pixelate, for example. Um, but it's hard to see with that. Um, yeah, and so go ahead and turn on the webcam and try adding some different colors um, to the webcam or different functions. You can so again, you can use any of the geometry functions or the color uh, functions after. And please don't hesitate if something's not working, like your camera's not working or something, um, wave. <laughs> I'll wave. Uh, do you, I have a webcam here if you. too much and you want it to slow down overall, there's a parameter overall called speed. And so, um, well right now I don't have anything that's like continuously moving, but say I uh, was continuously scrolling here um, and say I want it to just stop, I can put speed equals zero. And now like the things are still happening but everything that's moving 
stops moving, um, and you can change that variable. Um, but yeah, if if just something to remember, if you change the speed, then you have to change it back uh, to one is the default speed. So um, yeah, if I do like ten, then ah, <laughs> could go really fast. I can't remember. <laughs> um. Okay, how are we doing? Um, I next want to show blending, which is how to blend multiple things Okay, I'm going to show now. I don't know why I'm not using the microphone. Um, now I will show how to combine multiple um, sources together. Oh, oh, I will do that. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, colorama is a fun one for add, just like adding color, like. Ah, it is. I don't know. I haven't used After Effects in a long time, so yeah, a, this is. Ah, okay. Ah, I didn't even. I don't even know where <laughs> if I got it from that or not. But color, I'm. I will put it there. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and just so all the different external sources uh, are down here, so you can see examples for using images, using video, um, and using screen capture. And um, in its stream is a bit you can like live stream to anyone else using Hydra, um, but I, it's a little it's disabled in the public version right now because of a weird technical error, but if you're interested in that, we could talk about that during the jam session if you want to like live stream between people. Um, question? Yeah, exactly. So actually when I made Hydra, I made it to play around with this live streaming thing, and so um, anyone who connects to Hydra is like, you can make yourself kind of available for other people to use what you're using as a source. Um, can you send it out as Hydra to other applications that are um, That, you would have to use something external like OBS or something. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the question was can you send it out, uh, like siphon to other applications? Um, and uh, I think you would have to use another application like uh, OBS to capture the Hydra window and send it to something else. Um, but yeah, now I want to uh, go back 
to show a bit about blending and multiple, both blending and modulation, which are the last kind of two sets of functions here. Um, and so uh, I'm going to, okay, so actually what I'll do is uh, type another function which is called render. And so what render does is it actually divides the screen into four. Um, and so um, in Hydra, same as you can have multiple sources, you can also have multiple virtual outputs. Um, and so when the screen is divided into four, it's showing kind of all these different virtual outputs. And so um, there's sort of like different canvases or different screens that you can ren render things to. And then later you can also mix those things together. Um, and so right now, everything that I've been doing has been being rendered to the um, O0, which is the like uh, basic, the, the first virtual output. Um, and actually, I'm going to make this a bit simpler just so we can see more what's happening. So um, right now, I am initializing the camera here, and then I'm doing source s0 dot out. Um, and I have nothing in parentheses here where it says dot out, and that's the same as if I typed O0. And so these, like, if you can imagine the screen is divided into four, this part is corresponds to the first output, which is O0, O1 is here, O2, and O3. And I think when I show this a little, it will become clear, but, um, yeah, basically right now what I'm doing when I put this O0 in parentheses, or if I have nothing in parentheses, it's saying send this source to output O0, which is in the top left corner. And so now what I could do is, let's say I have make an oscillator, and I say dot out, but instead of putting O0, I put O1. Now it goes um, to this, which is O1. Um, and so these are just kind of internal different outputs um, that are useful for when you want to like blend different things together or kind of have frame buffers um, of things. That, and and I, the reason I'm showing this now is it's, uh, it helps with seeing how blending works when you can see kind of all the things that are, are blending together. Um, and so, yeah, again, in order to see these four screens, you have to type render with nothing in parentheses down here. So I'm gonna now put this also in the pad. Um, so four screens. Um, and so now that I have these two things here, what I can do is blend them together um, and so again, this top left is O0, here is O1. And what I could do is take O0 as a source, which is the camera up here, and I can blend it with O1, which is the oscillator, and I could send it out to O2, which is uh, here in the top right. Um, and so now it's, t it's taking these two visual sources and it's blending them. And so um, what blending is doing is it's combining the colors of two things. Um, so it's, it's actually going pixel by pixel here and pixel by pixel here, and it's averaging the colors uh, of the first pixel here with the first pixel here, and then, um, yeah. Yeah? And so the question was, can you blend more than two things together? And the answer is yes, you can actually blend uh, somewhat infinite numbers of things together until your computer crashes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that could be a, during the jam, you could see how many things you could blend together. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so if I also change parameters of this oscillator, you'll see it changes here and it changes there as well. Um, uh, 
for example. And then also blending functions. Um, so there's a second parameter, which is like how much to blend. So if I put like a low number here, it's like barely blending the oscillator. If I put one, it's completely blending the oscillator. And then in between, it's, it's the default that's like half and half of the two things. Um, and then there's also other blending modes. So uh, the blending modes are kind of the mathematics that, you, that is being used to composite the two sources together. So here, if I say diff, um, it's, well, it's, this is kind of confusing with colors. So I'm gonna make the oscillator black and white again. But um, here it's, you can see it's doing something different with, um, how these two things are composited together. Or um, actually, also uh, molt is another one. And so if you've used kind of Photoshop or video programs, then um, you might have seen these types of, of blending modes before. And it's a bit, um, I think like in, because in Hydra, you're basically telling each pixel what color to be. So when you have two things coming together, um, you have to kind of tell the computer how do you want to combine these two things. Um, and so blending is one way of kind of combining two separate visual sources. And, and it's combining the colors of those, of those two things. Um, and so uh, going back to the, uh-huh. Oh, yeah, that's a good question, actually. Yeah, so I have this, I'm mostly doing this divided screen thing just to show you, um, just so you can see visually what's being blended with what. If I just wanted to render uh, the, the output of the blending, which is uh, O2 up here in the top right, I can uh, put O2 in parentheses with this render function and so render is just telling, telling it which of the different sources to render. And so again, when render has nothing, it does all four. When it's O2, now it's just doing the output. If I do O0, it's just doing the camera. If I do O1, it's just doing the oscillator. And so that's one way, like let's say you're doing a live performance. That's one way that you could like have different visuals and switch between them, for example. Um, but sometimes it's also just useful in this kind of like debugging way or like, yeah, sometimes I'll like render a texture to one and then like use that texture on shapes in a different um, output. Um, so I just wanna show the very last type of um, function. Uh, and then, actually, no, I want to I wanna do one other thing first, which is um, talk a little bit more about colors, because here we're talking about combining colors. And um, yeah, this kind of blend mode thing is really common in different graphics softwares. Um, and I think it's interesting to actually think a little bit more about how um, color is represented on the computer. And so, what I have here is actually a microscope, um, like a USB microscope. And so uh, I'm gonna see if I can see the microscope on here. Um, oh yeah, and so this is interesting. So actually with the camera, um, you can uh, change. If you have like a webcam connected, you can select a different camera source by um, putting a different number there. And I'll see if I can get this microscope to work here. Okay, that's OBS. Oh yeah, here it is. Okay. Oh yeah, that could be fun during the jam is to play around with the um, with the uh, with webcams also. Uh, so now I have this USB microscope that's actually just a webcam like kind of flipped around. Um, and so here, if I put this to the screen, what you will see, Ooh. so you'll see that, uh, maybe, I'm gonna actually stop this from moving. 
for a sec. So, okay. So, uh, and I'm gonna focus it a bit. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So, um, now what you can see, actually I'll make this bigger. So I'm gonna show, or wait, no, if I make it bigger, I won't have the oscillator. So you can kind of see that, but basically this is my screen right now under a microscope. And you can see these, these LEDs. Um, ooh, it's hard to keep it focused, but okay. So you can see these LEDs. Um, wait, I'm gonna make it actually bigger for a sec just so we can see it better. Okay. Oh yeah, that could be, that could be great. Um, okay, yeah, it's just, so hold it on something white. Like, oh, you have to hold it all the way like against the screen, yeah. Um, so, and this, this focuses it, but I think it's, so yeah, you can see, this is like the button, and so where it's white, uh, you can see all the LEDs turned on, and you see they're red, green, and blue LEDs. And so basically, um, when you're programming in the graphics card, you're telling the computer which LEDs to turn on. And so when you do like RGB color, you're saying, it, so um, this is, okay, I'm gonna do something a bit, oh, I'm gonna go back to showing multiple screens. And so let's say uh, there, there's a function in Hydra called color. So color, uh, if I do one, 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 what it does is, um, oh, oh no, solid, sorry, it's called solid. Um, so solid just makes a solid thing. I'm gonna put the camera back in the first one and I'm gonna put the solid out to the second output and go ahead and move the microscope to the solid that I'm doing over here. So, so now the microscope is showing um, the color of this uh, square in the bottom. And so this, um, like I guess the computer uses red, green, and blue color to just tell each pixel which, which LEDs to turn on. And so here it's telling the computer, it's saying turn all the LEDs on, um, on the whole screen. But if I say one, zero, zero here, uh, it's telling the computer just turn on all the red LEDs. And if I put like one, one, zero, it's saying turn on the red and green LEDs. Um, and if I, so it's, it's like red, green, and blue. And so now it's saying turn on the blue LEDs. Um, and so I think this will come up a lot more in the shader section perhaps, but um, basically, yeah, all that like digital color when you're working with RGB values, you're literally telling the computer turn on, turn on the red LEDs, turn on the green LEDs, turn on the blue LEDs, and the computer can make all common or like many combinations of color based on which thing it turns on. Yeah, so in this context, they go from zero to one. In like hex colors, you go from zero to 255 or something, in, often in the computer. Oh, but, or no, in, in Hydra, it's zero to one, but in other, like any com program on the computer, you're like representing color in a different way. So if I say oscillator, for example, now you'll see, it, I mean, it's, Maybe I'll make it a little slower. Ah, so. So now it's, uh, it's going, um, it's turning on the LEDs, it's turning off the LEDs. Um, and if I, this function that makes the oscillator have more colors, it's kind of just separating where the different colors are. So it's like turning them on at slightly different times. Um, it's for 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 oscillator or for oh that's how fast it's going. Um yeah that's how it's how if it's zero it's black and white and then the more the higher the color value the more split the different it's like if you had a red green and blue one all on top of each other and you like slid them out. I don't know if that makes sense. Maybe this is just a bit detailed. But so say I have just the, this 
oscillator, and then I do color after it, which is sort of the volume of the different these different LEDs. So if I do, I just have the oscillator, and then I do color after it. Now it's just red, um, and then if I were to do like just the middle one, it would be just green, for example. Um, and so I just like to show that because it's like actually this programming is corresponding to a physical thing in the computer and like a physical thing in projectors. And so when these all of these instructions from the computer are telling the computer based on which point of the screen we are on, which which LEDs should turn on. And so when you're blending two things together, it's kind of taking um, the color of one thing and the color of the other, and then it's deciding based on that which, which LEDs should, should turn on. Um. Uh, no, color can take three arguments. So like the first is, like the first is red, the second is green, the third is blue. But you can make this, so it's a bit like, um, it is a bit weird because you can have like higher numbers, like 10, and it, that kind of just makes it more red. But obviously, I guess, or like, it, it, it has a kind of weird um, behavior, I guess. And if you do negative one, um, it turns the, it, it's like an, in, it inverts it. Um, I don't know if that, so if I, it's hard to see with the oscillator actually. If you do it with the camera, basically it turns the dark areas um, to be that color instead of the light areas. And this is actually something I took from analog video. Like usually in digital color, you kind of just either turn the colors on or off. But I saw some analog video synthesizers that had negative color. So this is a bit like, Say I have, um, okay, I'll put the cam, oh wait, okay. Uh, it, this would be easiest to see with the webcam also. So this is like a bit of a tangent, but um, I'm show, I, I'll show, maybe I can show my regular camera again. Oh, sorry. Also, it's okay if you don't want to stand. Um, I don't know, I would, thought I would show my, Oh, I'm not showing S1. Okay, that's why. S1. Okay, so now I have like the microscope here and I have my regular camera here. And so with my regular camera, if I do color one, zero, zero, it will become red. But if I do color negative one, it turns like the dark areas red. So um, like it's a bit, if I then do, uh, I have like, green as positive, it's turning the light areas green and the negative areas red. Um, and this is just something that I took from like analog video stuff where it's kind of like you have a volume control on the different colors and you can like make them negative. Um, this was kind of a deep dive into colors and a bit of a tangent, but any questions about this? Or? Um, yeah, it's helpful to keep thinking about this LED thing also when you like do graph, like shader programming also, I think. Um, yeah? Uh, so there was a question, is there a way to adjust the alpha value of color? So I think actually the last parameter does that. Uh, but it's, you only see the alpha if you have something behind it. Um, and still, actually, alpha can be compu confusing on computers. Like, like to us, alpha is like something can be on top of another thing, and it's transparent, and so you can see through that thing to the thing behind it. But the computer still needs to decide kind of like what color does each pixel need to be. So the computer still has to do decide whether to like average that pixel with the one that's quote behind it or not. Does that make sense? So, it yeah. This is all to say it gets like complicated. <laughs> um, yeah. So I just want to show the last kind of type of Hydra function, which is the modulate function. Um, and yeah, I'll still have this microscope and stuff. So when we do jam stuff, we can play around with it. Also, if anyone's excited about that. Um, so 
Uh, I'm gonna go uh, back to just showing this camera, and thank you, Kate, for holding the. <laughs> it's very nice. Um, yeah, so uh, we have camera, and we have this oscillator down here. I'm gonna like simplify this code a little bit. Just go back to like, uh, oops. Okay, so just to what what's here? I have a camera, top left, oscillator. Uh, and top left is O0, so I'm sending the camera up here to O0. Um, here I have the oscillator, I'm sending it to O1, and here I'm, uh, ignore this basically, I'm gonna just, uh, now I'm gonna type something else for what's going to O2, that's in the top right. So um, let's say I start with the camera again, um, and here I'll just send it out to O2, so now I'm, sending the camera to the top left, I'm sending an oscillator to the bottom left, and I'm sending the, the camera again to the top right. And actually what I want to do is send the output of the top left, O0, I'm sending it to the top right. Um, and before what we were doing, we did the blend function, and so I was blending, um, taking the camera from the top left, blending it with the oscillator, in the bottom left and sending the result here to the right. And I realized I didn't actually save this code, so I just, we went down that deep dive into L to everything, but I wanna um, put the blending here so you have it. Um, and now I just wanna show, oops, the last type of function in Hydra, which is modulate. And so here, I'm gonna, instead of blend, I'm gonna put modulate. And so you'll see um, it starts to warp the image. And so what it's doing is instead of going pixel by pixel and combining all the colors, it's going pixel by pixel, but it's using um, the colors of this texture in the bottom left to displace the top left. And so actually it's translating the red which we saw with the LED thing, it's tra tra translating the red to X displacement and the green to Y displacement, and that generates this sort of warpy effect that you see. And so if I, for example, um, have a higher frequency of oscillator, you see it affects um, how the image in the top right is being warped. And also there's a second um, parameter here of modulator, which is of modulate, which is how much to to do it. So if I do like 0.5, it's one would be completely displacing it in the screen, and zero is not displacing it at all. Um, and so, uh, actually, what happens if I do one? Okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you can play around with how much it's being warped. Um, and then also, if I change this oscillator, for example, if I make it a kaleidoscope, of course, it'll also have this, it'll affect the image. And another thing I like to do, for example, with this is like pixelate, I think it can be fun. So like, it makes this like, um. So these are the main types of functions in Hydra. Um, uh, let's see how we're doing, okay, we have like half an hour, a little over half hour left. Um, Go ahead and try playing around a bit with this, like make something in the top left, something in the bottom left, and try blending or modulating it together in the top right. I'm gonna share this um, sketch also in the um, pad.
Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, so I see lots of beautiful things on your screens and hypnotizing trippy things as well and some stroby things. Um, and we don't have that much left until lunch and I want to show a few more things and of course there'll be plenty more time to play around with stuff in the jam section. Um, but yeah, feel free to share links to what you're making also in the uh, pad. Um, but yeah, I want to show, um, basically I want to show a little bit about feedback um, to end this um, and point you a bit to like further resources for, for doing more. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, actually we have a little bit longer time than I thought, which is great because there's uh, so many other things. Um, yeah, there's also a lot of other things to look at. Um, yeah, actually, I'm going to show further resources um, just so you know where that is. And then I'll show the video feedback to end because it can be quite hypnotizing. Yes, one question. How to bring audio? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yes, that's definitely um, possible. So um, going back to this uh, resources thing, let's see. I think this is updated. If I click the interactive documentation, this is a brand new uh, documentation. And so if you click here to learning, um, there's kind of an overview of some um, documentation about how to do some different things. So for example, um, this question about audio is under the se sequencing and interactivity section. Um, and so actually anything in Hydra that's a number can also be a number that changes over time or is affected by things outside of Hydra, which um, could be a MIDI controller, it could be audio, it could be a function that you write, it could be like data you get from, uh, I also have some game controllers, so I sometimes use game controllers to control different parameters. Um, and so um, this doc documentation is very kind of new and work in progress, and it's just kind of a collage of different things that different people have written. And so you're very encouraged. Um, if you're looking at something here, there's this handy edit this page function. So if you find a typo or something that you know, could be better documented. Um, Hydra is all open source, um, and so it means that it's me and other people who kind of contribute their time to building this, that are, are building it and sharing it with other people. Um, and so uh, it's, so this is one way to uh, find more information. Um, Actually, I've, I haven't put that on this website yet, but there's also a Discord where people uh, share stuff that they're working on. Um, another thing I want to share briefly in the afternoon after learning about shaders is now, um, well, I'll just share this, but there's a bunch of extensions that people have made uh, for Hydra. Um, kind of adding on different libraries or using it in combination with different JavaScript libraries. Um, what's kind of fun is that the editor of Hydra executes JavaScript and it's written in JavaScript. And so you can kind of infinitely hack itself, if that makes sense. And and JavaScript has is kind of flexible as a language, where, as Sarah talked about a bit in her talk yesterday. So you can kind of like do what you want with it. <laughs> um, so anyways, in this special super secret link that I will share, that's the dev branch of Hydra, there's this um, puzzle piece. This is like brand new. And there, then that brings up a bunch of different um, extensions that people have written. So for example, um, where did it go? Oh, Hydra Text, for example, is one 
that Geika wrote, and then you could see text in Hydra, for example. Um, or basically different people have written different libraries and examples of things to do, um, and also using it with different JavaScript libraries. Um, P5 is actually already built into it, but um, I don't wanna go down this rabbit hole just to show you that there's lots of things there. Uh, there yeah, and... Um, Oh yeah, yeah, I haven't showed that yet. So it's um, actually, I'll put Hydra dev branch. And so uh, it's actually just adding slash dev to the end of the URL. And um, yeah, maybe with the dev branch, it's a bit more like use at your own risk. It might uh, change as things are updated. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a great place to do different things. Um, yeah, I wanna, oh, I guess we, okay, we still have some time. Any question? Any questions about this? I wanna now show a few more functions kind of internal to Hydra and not go into extending it, but just so you know where the different resources are. Um, yeah, something I'm really excited actually to extend the, uh, this kind of extensions and examples thing because um, I think now Hydra has existed for six years and um, it is open source and so people often will contribute code and I found it kind of hard to maintain when people want to change code that affects the core library and so the extension system is a way to have like lots of different ideas and lots of different things are do that people are doing without having to change too much the way the basic thing uh, functions. And so um, this is one thing that's happening now is this extension system. And also um, another thing, so there's a um, basically an open collective page where people donate to support kind of hosting and other aspects of Hydra. Um, and um, so this right now goes to the hosting of it and some development, but it especially goes to, uh, we started this grant, micro grant uh, program recently. And so basically once a year, the, the fund supports projects that people are doing or kind of extensions uh, to Hydra. And it, part of it is thinking of open source software as not just like the technical development of it, but it's actually all this documentation and workshops or performances that people are making with it. And so actually, this is something I need to work on like this week and next, but this was like last year's grants. Um, and then there were six recipients and this year we're gonna launch them again. And so the, the, the fund goes towards the, um, the grants. But yeah, this is all kind of, uh, it's just like funded by the people who use it, which who are all over the world. And we also have some meetups. And so it's become this little like weird community that you're all welcome to be a part of, or many of you already are. But <laughs> yeah, well, you all are now, but. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, any questions about this stuff? I'm going to show feedback, which is like my favorite thing to end. Um, OK, cool. Um, actually, could I borrow that webcam again? Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, actually, um, if you want to grab, a, well, I'll show this first, and then if you feel like grabbing a webcam, um, we can pass them around. Um. Okay. Um, so uh, now I'm going to, uh, I cleared everything that was here. 
And um, I'm gonna try to show the camera again. And again, to show the camera, um, it's this source, seo.app, and let's see. Okay, so there we have this. Um, yeah, I guess we can already see some feedback here. Yeah, maybe I don't even need the other camera. Um, but we have this effect here, and the reason that this effect is happening is basically, um, oops, what did, oh, I disconnected the projector, let's see. Okay, okay, so, um, so right now the camera um, is picking up what's on the projector and then it's rendering it to the screen. Wait, no, then the camera, which, it, which is the projector, and then the camera is looking at the projector again and then it's rendering it and then the camera is looking at what it's rendering and so it turns into this infinite loop thing um, like kind of like when you have two mirrors looking at each other that goes off into infinity. And you see there's like a little delay and that delay is like the delay actually internal to the projector and the computer and all this stuff. So when I like move really fast, get stuck. So um, one way, so there's ways of doing this basically in in analog video feedback, people use this a lot, like actually have a camera then pointed back at the screen. So one way of doing this is if you have a webcam and you're using, um, and the camera is pointed at your screen, and then, um, yeah, basically it's picking up what's coming out on the screen. But then there's also ways kind of internal to Hydra of working with feedback. Um, and that can open up a lot of possibilities. Um, because if you'll see right now, if I move the screen, it's like really, it can be really sensitive to just like really small movements. Um, and then if you're doing the same thing, but more within the code, then you can have finer control over what happens. Um, and so some of you I saw kind of did this either accidentally or on purpose, but um, right now, as we saw, source S0 is, uh, if I don't put anything in parentheses, it's the same as saying out to O0. So right now, I'm starting with the camera and then sending it out to, um, uh, I'm sending it out to the output. And actually, maybe having this extra feedback is like too confusing right now, so I'm gonna go like this, just so we can see a little. Um, oops. And before, what we saw was that you can blend, like if you have multiple outputs, you can blend them together. You can also directly blend within a single function chain. So um, for example, before we were rendering the oscillator to the other output and then blending them together, I could also just directly type the oscillator here, just so you, you know that this is possible. And, and so doing things like this, then you can I, you can keep kind of blending infinite numbers of things together, if that makes sense. Um, it's just the reason I showed it to you the other way with the multiple screens was to see better what, what was happening. Um, but here I could, I had, so I'm starting with the camera and then I'm blending it with the oscillator that's in here, but I, and I could also start, for example, if I just wanna rotate this oscillator, um, I could put there the rotate inside here, whereas if I put the rotate at the end, then it like rotates everything. Does that make sense? So this got a bit trippy, but um, anyways, uh, yeah, this got quite trippy. I'm gonna go back to just <laughs> rotating the oscillator, and I, I'm gonna um, share this um, in the, in the pad, um, so, ooh, ah, oh no, did I delete something? No, I don't think so, okay. Um, ooh, okay. 
Somehow the pad is like jumping me around. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, and so uh, like you could then then I could um, also modulate this with like noise or and like keep keep adding different things or maybe instead of blend I want to do uh, molt or something um, and so yeah you can kind of keep keep doing these different things um, another thing right now I've just been adding all the functions like into a single chain and the code it doesn't care that much how you format the code um, and so something that I personally like to do is put like different things on different lines. Um, and what this means is you can, it's easier to kind of turn off little pieces of the code. But this is just a personal preference. It's like there's as many ways to write code and format code as there are programmers. But like for me, let's say I wanna um, like j see what this looks like without the oscillator for a bit. I could put two slashes at the front of this and run the code again, and so now I see it without the oscillator. And so two slashes tells the computer to just ignore this one line of code, um, and encoding that's called a comment, basically. So I could, if I wanna just like turn this on and off, I can um, put these two lines. And um, you can also, uh, there's also a key command that's like control shift F that automatically formats the code for you. Um, and in the documentation, it says all the key commands. There's a few others that are helpful. But um, yeah, I just wanted to show this. So all the stuff that you were doing in the different buffers, you can also do it within a single buffer um, or output. Um, and now I wanna go back to showing feedback. So um, I'm gonna, I'll put this in the pad and um, comments. Oh, it keeps like, Jumping me down, okay, there. And so now, so um, here what we have, we're starting with the camera and I'm gonna get rid of all this stuff. We're starting with the camera and we're sending it to the output. Um, but what I could do is then blend that output back in with the input. And so uh, what I'm gonna do here is blend with O0. And so when I do that, it kind of looks the same. Um, so it's just taking this output and it's blending it because it's blending like what's being output on the screen with the camera. It, it ends up being, it's blending the last frame with what's currently there. Um, and so right now it looks basically the same. But if I put this number, um, like remember blend has a second parameter that's how much to blend the second thing with the first thing. So if I put one here, it actually just stays still. And so that's because it's taking the output and then it's completely blending it and then it's like that's what you see and then it's completely blending it again and then that's what you see and then it's completely blending it again and then that's what you see. Um, so if I then after this, um, make this a little bigger each frame. So uh, there's a function scale that makes the image a little bigger. So if I do this, it's now, it just like, <laughs> it's gone basically. And so um, now I'm not gonna see it again because it just the output, are you guys you still see my nose there, but. Um, <laughs> um, so what I could do is instead of blending the output completely with the camera, say I wanna see just a little bit of the camera each time, instead of putting one, I could put 0 0.99. And so now you kind of see the camera, um, but it's mostly being blended with the um, output and it makes these kind of ghosty trails. Maybe if I put it a little less, like 0 0.6, like this like ever expanding um, ghost trails. Um, and this, this can be fun to play with also. Um, it's, it's very similar to what we were doing basically of putting the um, 
camera back on itself. Um, and I could also, for example, if I add a little more contrast, each time it's being blended again, it's um, just gonna change the contrast a little bit. And so now it's getting a little darker. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll share this already, so. Um, Camera feedback. It does this every time I try to, okay. There. Um, and so this can also be really interesting when you use it with the modulate function. And so modulate, if you remember what it does is it uses the color of one thing to affect the coordinates of the other thing. And so if I also use um, modulate, so I can also modulate with O0. So then it's using the colors of this, what we're seeing to push the pixels in different directions. And so if I just do modulate, it's like, like really wild. But like, let's say I make it just a very small number. So I'll do like this and maybe I'll make the contrast a little higher, let's see. I don't know, actually sometimes, yeah. Also the order can like really change things here. Um, and maybe I'll try taking out the scale just so we see just what the modulate is doing. Um, and if I, like I could play around with some of these values a little bit, or maybe I'll modulate it a little more. So now I have this, um, it ends up being, the dark regions don't move on each frame and the brighter regions are being pushed more. So it, it can, it ends up creating these sorts of like liquidy things. Um, and doing things like adding more saturation also can make kind of like different things happen. Um, and this kind of, uh, glitchy, liquidy effect. Um, yeah, and it's kind of hard. I think sometimes with feedback, the easiest way to work with it is just to play around with it because sometimes trying to wrap your head around what's actually happening is like kind of complicated because like this thing is feeding back into this thing and blah, blah. Um, let me see if I like take. So, um, yeah, basically here it's, uh, starting with the camera, it's blending the last frame back into it and it's adding some saturation and then it's using the modulate uh, to, based on the color of each pixel, it's moving it. Um, and, and based on if you change the amount that it's being blended, like it, now I put, um, I'm like really blending it I put 0.99. Um, it does seem to keep going to red for some reason. Um, yeah, it kind of often depends on your specific webcam and computer. Like sometimes they like tend towards different colors or something. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll share this sketch um, here. Um, also, so feedback. Um, and so this is kind of like, this looks um, a lot like kind of a fluid or a liquid. And actually it's really similar to the way people modulate fluid dynamics on computers um, and, and differential equations, which is basically you're starting with the last thing and then you're incrementally changing all the parts of it. And so what I like about video feedback is that you can kind of play with these complex math topics like differential equations um, that is kind of like taking something and incrementally changing it um, that you can just like intuitively sort of play with these kinds of things visually. Um, yeah, maybe I'll try. And you could also like uh, change the hue on each frame a bit, which, ooh, then it gets like a bit wild, but I don't know. I, I 
can't remember. I think also like the order matters. But yeah, it's like if you can imagine um, you could write the same code um, a million times and never get the pixels to be exactly the same, like in the same place. And that's kind of like a chaotic or unpredictable type of system where even though these are precise instructions to the computer, um, also because we're using the camera, but um, we could never like replicate the exact same thing. <laughs> um, any any questions about this? Um, I really recommend if you're interested in video feedback, there is a video um, called Space Time Dynamics in Video Feedback that was made in the 80s. Oh, 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 do you want me? I'll paste the code. Is that what you? Oh, yeah, okay, I'll paste the code. Um, let's see, okay. Feedback with you. Uh, so, yeah, you could, um, so in that same part of the documentation where I showed you sequencing and interactivity, there's a bunch of ways where you could change between different numbers. Um, yeah. Yeah, so actually the easiest way the easiest way is to use an array, I'll just show this quickly, which is like a list of numbers. And so if you, like say, okay, so with blend, I could either have this kind of like blobby effect, or I can have it be completely blended. And say I wanted to switch between these two states, because this kind of, after a while, it kind of dissipates, but yeah, to me yeah. it's nice to go back to the other one sometimes. So I can go, I can basically put, put these two values here, so I put like 0 0.94 and 1 in brackets, which is how you make an array or a list in JavaScript. So I'm gonna now run this code, and it's gonna, hopefully, it's gonna switch between these two values now. Um, um, yeah, so there's different, um, actually, Basically, you can write your own JavaScript function. Like, the arrays are sort of a built-in way of switching between things. But you can write your own. So if you go to the custom function section um, here, then it kind of shows you. It's more like you have to write a sign function as a sign of time, basically. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and then just for, f I'll add a link to this video. Basically, um, Jim Crutchfield made this in the 80s, and he was a, a, a physicist and video artist. And um, this uh, video, I'll just, I guess, okay, I'll just show it really quick. With the, to the video camera viewing its own monitor. So here's, he, here he's showing us his setup a bit. You can see his uh, modular video synthesizer there with all the cables. Um, and then now he's like panning over to, we're looking at the camera and you see the, um, 
output screen. And now we're like zooming in to feedback land. So this video goes on and um, he there's a paper that accompanies the video and what he did in I think like 1984 was he explained how this closed loop feedback system was capable of modeling a bunch of complex math concepts like reaction diffusion and fluid dynamics and stuff and what's interesting is like uh, this is like an analog system with the camera viewing itself and only recently have computers been able to also do this in real time in the same way or like um, because of more complicated graphics capabilities but at this time this analog system was able to do these things like specifically chaos fractals and this kind of thing and so um, yeah, there's a lot of ways in Hydra of playing with these things, like either having an external camera and doing it more in this analog way or um, having buffers feeding back into each other. And I just wanted to give you a little like taste of that with the, the sketch that I showed. So um, I think we're getting close to being done and we could just play around. Thank you all for Thank you so joining much. the workshop. Yay. Hi everyone, so good to be here. Did you know that the first time that I ever taught this workshop was in 2019 in this very room? Yeah, so you get to see, and then, <laughs> nice applause. <laughs> so you get to see um, all of the, like after, or I guess, yeah. I don't know if anyone was there is here, but. No. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, where I'm like all like nervous and shaking. And I'm still nervous and shaking, but you can tell less. <laughs> um, okay, so I really want to go around and can everyone go around and say what the first word that pops into your mind when you hear the word shader? It's, so it's just like, you could just say like, oh yeah, you have another mic. microphone. Eh? Okay, great, so yeah. I'll go down the middle. Oh, great. Okay, sick. You could say your, your name, pronoun, and then the first word that comes to your mind when you hear the word shader. Hi, I'm Erin, um, and the first word I think of when I think of shaders is sorcery. <laughs> Similarly, the first word I think of when I think of shaders is mathematics. Yes! I, what's, what's I'm Teo. Hey. Pronouns he and she. Great. Hi, I'm Colin. Uh, pronouns he, they. The first word is probably texture, maybe. Mm. All right. My name is Alicia, and I think of graphics cards. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Sauda, she, her, and I think of um, 3D. Ah. My name is Jamie, uh, he, they, and I, uh, I've been around a while, so I kind of think um, outdated. Ah. Oh, spicy. Uh, my name is Fu Guo, and one thing, one hearing shader. Yes, just any word. I think of unity. Ah, <laughs> yes. Wonderful, we're gonna get some unity at the end. Uh, Heather, she, her, and I'm gonna be predictable, games. Games, great. My name is Daraya, I use she, they, and I guess I just think of like, where you pick a color in the circle. Yes, like, oh, yeah, there's gonna be so many colors, so many circles. <laughs> Hi, my name is Will, and I think of clouds, the original shaders. Because they shade people. Oh, I was like, what framework is that? <laughs> Hi, I'm M, and I think of SDFs. Whoa. Nice. We might have to do the SDFs and then. I'm Ethan. I use they, them pronouns, and I think GPUs. Sick. 
I'm Jorge, uh, he, him, and I think of pixels. Sick. My name's Olivia, she, they, and I think of material. My name is Nika, they, them, and I think of screen savers. What? <laughs> We're gonna make some screen spenders today. <laughs> Uh, my name is Leah, they, them. I think of parallelism. Whoa, yes. My name is Yoni, uh, I, he, him, and I also think of parallelism. Sick. Whoa, two in a row, parallel. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Olga, she, they, and I think of Eminem. Eminem? Oh, shady. So shady! Oh my gosh! <laughs> I've been, yes, never heard that one. I do this every single workshop. That's the first time. Yes. Um, my name is Lori, and I also thought of parallelism, but what? Okay. I love this parallel corner over there. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is, oh, no, this is loud. Hi, my name is Sylvia, she, her. Uh, I thought of shadow milkshake. A shadow milkshake? B because shader as a milkshake and shadow oh and shade. Oh my god, that's beautiful. I think I just got the chills. <laughs> that was great. Hey everyone, Lawrence. Uh, I don't use specific pronouns. Um, I, I thought of graphics cards. Sick. Very sick. My name is Diane and I think of blackness. Aww. My name is Yo-Yo. Uh, I think of, you know, it's, like, well, it's a little guy. Mm, you know, yeah. can't do much, but there's a lot of them. Exactly. That's a great point. My name is Susie. I use all pronouns, and I might have to have two words. One would be effects, and the other one would be scary. Whoa. I'm scared of shaders. <laughs> Here, this is, the, this is the time to air it out. Yeah. My name is Dana, he, him, and for me, it's perceiving depth. Ooh, layers. Maggie, she is fine, and I was literally like, IDK, what the fuck? Yes! <laughs> Chaos. Okay, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for, thanks for doing that, everyone. It, it also, like, it super helps me, like, kind of get a feel of, like, what everyone's at, because it's a truly, like, a one-room schoolhouse here. Uh, like, we have some, like, people who work in industry, and some folks who are like, hmm, like, I, this is the first time I'm hearing about it. Or, I mean, in, yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Char Styles. Um, I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. I'm a computation artist, programmer, researcher, algo rat. <laughs> um, again, like I said, Studio for Creative Inquiry alumna, um, former software engineer at NVIDIA, and currently a graduate student at MIT. Uh, but mostly, I just like dry shaders, and that's what I'm here to do with you today. Um, oh, yeah, you saw this video yesterday, but I just wanted to give like a tiny little bit of context of like, what I do so that you can position yourself relative to me so that you can like discard the information that you don't want because like you know like that's just like where I'm coming from you know that's not applicable to you or whatnot so basically when I write shaders I normally do it in performative uh, context like any folks here too um, and so I uh, have the code displayed so everyone I'm so happy everyone's like already quetted on live coding I don't have to spend so much time talking about it um, and oh, and I wanted to also uh, show you the manifesto draft. It's been mentioned yesterday, maybe briefly mentioned today, but basically the ethos of live coding is a shape that is alluded to here because it is a very ambiguous, amorphous thing that is the, you know, that is live coding. My favorite part about this manifesto draft, this kind of, um, is, is, the, is the last point that says live coding is not about tools. Algorithms are thoughts. Chainsaws are tools. That's why algorithms are sometimes harder to notice than chainsaws. So today we're gonna be working a lot with kind of turning our thoughts into algorithms. Uh, I'm gonna skip this video, some more. Okay, let me give you some context for shaders because you've probably heard many things about it you know, in kind of, in these kind of different, different, it's been, they can be described in many different ways, and so that can be really confusing to a lot of folks. Um, so what are they, where are they, who are they? Often shaders are described as wizards on your GPU that do math, and you don't have to worry about it. Just, just put in the shader, copy, paste it, it's like you don't have to think about it, because it's, it's kind of hard to think about. 
or they are <laughs> goblins. Our you know goblin processing unit is that is that a, is that a thing? <laughs> I forgot I added that. <laughs> okay, so what are they really? What they are are small programs that are copied directly onto your GPU that are run per pixel. And I'm gonna say this again and again throughout this workshop. It's gonna be the one, if one thing sticks in this workshop, it's gonna be this. Shaders are where the input is the pixel's X and Y position and the output is a color. That's the only thing I really want you to take away today. So if, that, if you take away today just saying that, I'll be very happy. Um, and so let's say you have an HD screen, so not all screens are HD, but some of them are. So that's 1920 by 1080, that's how many pixels there are on your screen. And let's say it's running at 60 hertz, so that's how many times the pixels are refreshing per second, and that's how many times the shader is being executed per pixel. So that means the shader program that we're gonna be writing today is going to be executed over 100 million times. And that is the basis of the power of shaders, is because it's a different way of thinking about processing at, at its very core level. You have to think in a lot more parallel ways. I'm looking at you, parallel corner. <laughs> and as opposed to kind of this uh, more, uh, or as opposed to very se sequentially thinking. So it's, I'm really happy that we talked about Hydra here because Hydra is another kind of like parallel brain. So parallel, you have to put it on your like parallel thinking caps to get into Hydra. So we've already been like kind of parallelized as people. Wow, that's a lot. Um, so just for a little context, this is what a really basic shader looks like. We don't have to worry about <laughs> the, the, the top part, but you can see the, uh, the pixels input. So remember, the pixels x and y position is the input, and that is this frag chord dot x, y. And then the output is a color. So basically what this shader, programming, this shader program is doing right here is it's visualizing the pixels position as a color. Another thing with shaders is that they're so low level you can kind of just pretend one type of data is, is another type of data. So uh, what's happening here is that, so the GL frag chord is uh, being given as like an X, Y position, like, okay, so there's zero, zero, and then one, zero, so and so forth, and it scales across the resolution of your screen. But colors in GLSL must range from zero to one. Oh, GLSL is, Great question. So what does GLSL stand for? It's a, this is, this is GLSL, and it stands for graphic, Open Graphics Library Shader Language. And it's basically the, the name of the language of how you write shaders. They can be, inter, like GLSL can be interchanged with shaders, but shaders are a more general term. Like I might be interchanging GLSL with shaders today, but shaders is a more general term uh, for uh, these programs that are, that are like, run in the graphics pipeline, which we're gonna get to in a little bit, right? Okay, so basically we're, we're taking the pixel's position, dividing the resolution so that it's a number between zero and one, and we're pretending that's the color. That's the most simple shader program, or one of the most simple shader programs you can write. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit what this uniform is, and like this vector two, and all these types, but this is basically, you know, pixels input is position, now put is color. I'm gonna say that again and again, I'm gonna be broken record. Um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> this is a, a funny illustration that Mythbusters made to describe how, like, the difference between a CPU drawing something and a shader drawing something. And so a shader, um, all of the pixels are executed all at once for, 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 for every single frame. So like, remember when I said 100, the pixels being run 100,000 times? Imagine this happening 100,000 times. And like the reason, something that's kind of particular about shaders, it's different than if you've done like other kind of graphical programming like P5 <laughs> or, you know, uh, or any kind of like, you know, in, like for even painting, you know, um, it's that y each pixel doesn't know what its neighbor is doing. Each pixel is just acting, it, it, it's only thing that it knows is, is its position. It only knows I'm the, the 23rd pixel X and the, 18th pixel Y, that's all it knows. And then it has to create a color based on that. And that's your job. <laughs> okay, so 
lots of you, like I said, one room schoolhouse, have probably heard shaders in different contexts. And you've heard of like vertex shaders, geometry shader, compute shader. Like what are they and how do they fit together and then what are we doing in context to all of that? This right here is a picture to describe the graphics pipeline. The graphics pipeline is a conceptualization of how we go from 3D data, just clumps of data, onto rendering it on your screen. And this is defined by this working group called Kronos Group. I was trying to last night specifically find out like who specifically developed GLSL, but it's like, no, Kronos did it. So it's just this like big conglomerate group of people who've like developed this. Um, okay, so who here has worked in 3D? So like touched a 3D model in any kind of way, opened up Blender, gazed upon a 3JS sketch. <laughs> so almost, almost everyone. And so in all of these 3D environments, you like Unity, you have Maya, you have, yeah, like you, you're usually familiar with like an OBJ, right? An object, like a, like a mesh. And that's, a, that's what, the, um, what a lot of this graphics pipeline is like, expecting you to work with. It's expecting you to work with meshes and to move the meshes around to make 3D environments. Uh, and so in the graphics pipeline, from your mess of data, you have a bunch of 3D points in a data structure that represents a mesh. And that mesh, those, those, that like, data that represents a mesh is put through a vertex shader. First it goes through vertex specification which prepares for the vertex shader and then the vertex shader is a shader that's run, instead of one time per pixel, it's run one time per vertex, all in parallel. So the same way that you know, in fragment shaders, uh, you know, all the pixels are run at once, it's like that, but, but just with the vertices. So it's a really, really nice, uh, you can use vertex shaders to do, uh, like move fur on like, an, on like a shader, of, of, like a, of like fur on an animal, something that's you know, very parallelized, you can make grass. Um, that's a vertex shader. Tessellation shader is an optional step that basically allows you to, to on the GPU, create more geometry. And so that's kind of like, if you, if you know you, <laughs> if you know that you want to have more detail, but it, it can be like noise detail, you can do that in the tessellation shader because you don't need a bunch of verte vertices defined outside of that data structure. So that's the tessellation. Also, if this, this, this stuff is kind of like, um, just I'm taking like a step out of, I know I'm using a lot of like jargon and if, if there's like a specific piece of jargon or anything, feel free to stop me and ask. But also another thing is um, the graphics pipeline isn't really going anywhere soon. So, <laughs> so if any of this stuff is kind of like, oh, I, like I, I didn't pick up all of it, that's okay. You can let it wash over you like the ocean. Pick up, pick up what you want, what you can, what kind of sparks joy and leave the rest and the thing is like I said it'll be there for you later and so when the when it when the ocean comes back you can pick up more and it's this kind of like the graphics pipeline is a great ocean okay <laughs> and also none of this stuff is required for uh, learning what we're going to learn today it's just it's <laughs> because we're, we're just writing GLSO code I just want to like answer any like burning questions of like how does this exist on my computer like how can I apply this to like other things I do? This is just to kind of give that context. Um, okay, so right, back into the geometry shader. So the geometry shader was made by, <laughs> it's, it's kind of being phased out. It was specifically made by NVIDIA to render fur, uh, and it's, it's not, very, it's not uh, that relevant anymore. You might have heard something called a compute shader. A compute shader is a shader that is uh, not attached to the graphics pipeline per se, but can be basically use the GPU in a more generalized way. So you can use compute shaders to uh, do very parallel calculations that then you, you can do with other things with, with it. Like, like you can use it to compute cell, cellular automata or, or uh, reaction diffusion, those kind of parallel algorithms that Olivia mentioned. Um, and then the next three steps, 
Vert, so these, these next three yellow steps, vertex post-processing, primitive assembly, and rasterization. Basically, these are a bunch of matrices that are applied to the vertex positions after they were transformed and created by these previous four passes that squish them from 3D space into 2D space. Um, and it, it's, that's specifically like what rasterization is doing. It's like you kind of have like it computes like the thrust room of, of the camera and like given like, okay, so given where your pixel is, where your screen is in the scene, like which pixel should be associated with which fragment? A fragment is a way to describe a face that is between three vertices. So a fragment is basically like a, is like the solid part of a mesh. And a lot of times you see, you might see like wireframe, like renderings of meshes, that's like without the fragments. Great. And then we get to where we're gonna be working today. One very small part of the pipelines, the fragment shader. And basically that is how you color the pixels. So given you have all your 3D shapes and in the environment, and they're all put where they need to be on the screen, now you need to, the fragment shader answers the question of, okay, what are these pixels actually colored? Um, the shaders that we're gonna be writing today do actually have a, uh, all of these, these steps in them, but you just can't see them because it's just a quad that's rendered in front of the camera. It's just like, a, when I say a quad, I just mean like a, a plane that's taking up the entire view of the camera. So there is like a mesh that's involved, um, but it's just so simple, you don't really need to worry about it. But yeah, so again, all optional things to know. Um, I just wanted to kind of get that, uh, get that like out of the way. Um, this is an example, I just wanted to show how this kind of pipeline shows up in different environments. Has anyone used 3JS? Cool, nice, cool. Okay, I'll go through this really quickly then. So the basically like, this just shows that like in 3JS, you do need to specify a vertex and a fragment and then um, like pass those two into, the, into a material so that you get it. Um, oh yeah, this is my cringy quote. <laughs> um, it says the only time that I may have a cringy quote, so I, I get one. Um, and the quote is, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. And I like to say, it, when you write shaders, you have to think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration, but you've already been thinking about things in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration, because that's like Hydra, because everything is like this kind of electrical, like, you know, pulse running through it. So we're, again, putting on our parallel caps. Okay, great. So let's walk through some boilerplate code together. So I'm gonna show you, um, I'm gonna show you the uh, workshop page kind of like the, the, home, the home page that we're gonna be working off of. Uh, okay, yeah, so that's the, that was what we just did. Uh, and then we're gonna go through checkpoints together. I know this says see this recursive page. This is, <laughs> you could ignore that because we're on that page. Um, but if you scroll down, uh, you will see, you'll see the, the shaders that we're gonna write together. And I made this workshop so that if you kind of are, wanting to explore on your own and get lost, that is very welcome. You can just go back to the, in the you know, you can go back to the checkpoint when I, when I say we're gonna be at this checkpoint. So if any point you're like, oh, I, I, I messed up my shader and I can't get back to it, you, could, you just, you know, you just go and you copy and paste this, the, the code and you can get caught up to where, where we're gonna be at. Um, and yeah, and then at the end, I'm gonna go over, just to kind of get everyone excited to stay through, at the end, I'm gonna go over templates of how to take the shader that we wrote and put it in the different environments that you might use. So I know that uh, there was a touch designer workshop earlier uh, in the year here, uh, and so I made a template for touch designer, one for Unity, and then I made a Unity sticker sheet because I'm very familiar with Unity, so I kind of had a little fun making a bunch of extra functions you can copy and paste in, in within the Unity syntax. Also, Unity syntax is a little bit different, so I wanted to give everyone a little bit more things to play around with, and then P5. Uh, and then there's optional homework at the end. I'll go over in next steps, okay. Um, 
yeah, another thing about this workshop is, you know, this page will stay up. So, like I said, you can come back to it and it'll, it'll be there and you can kind of go through the examples and go through all the, the different resources and so and so forth. Because, you know, two hours to stay in shaders is, 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 is a, it's, a, it's difficult. Okay. Okay. Great. So, any, any questions going forward about the kind of what, the, what we're going to embark on the next, for the next 50 minutes? Great, super, wow, everyone's so focused. Okay, so the editor that we're going to be using is called The Force, and this was made by a fellow named uh, Sh Sh Sean Lawson, and it is, it, what it does is it renders the code in real time in the background of of what you're coding. So you can change this to be blue, and you'll see that as soon as it can compile, it will. And if you try to break it, it will just compile, have the last thing that it could compile be there. Excuse me. Okay. So let's let's just go over, let's try to recreate that shader that where the input is the pixel's position and the output is the pixel's position but rendered as a color very, very quickly, using the force. Uh, the the uh, example that I gave was uh, in the slideshow presentation that was using Shader Place, which is uh, an editor that I made for collaborative shader editing that I, when I teach it online, I use Shader Place, um, but I don't, I'm not using Shader Place now because it's, uh, because we don't need to be all on the same page uh, because you're all rendering it, rendering it locally on your screens and you're seeing mine in real time. And the, the force has some, some fun little, has other fun things that Shader Place doesn't have yet. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, in, in the force, you can access, or you can access this kind of like information bar if you kind of put your mouse down here. Um, and then it has these different kind of things to input and modulate and, uh, and to like pause the, or make it full screen. Um, in, in the force, you can, uh, the, you can see where, where the pixel's position is given to you uh, in like what, uh, or in the GL, yes. You can see the pixel's position is given to you as a GL frag chord. Uh, and uh, you can also see that you have a bunch of other uh, uniforms to play around with. And you might be asking, what is a uniform? Now, a uniform is a way, is like a window from the GPU to the CPU. The uniform is a global, when I say global, I mean that it can be accessed anywhere in the code, is a global variable. Um, that uh, conveys some information that is only accessible from the CPU. So the CPU is the thing that's like connected to the internet and the thing that's connected to, that controls all your screens. And so it's, a, it's basically like, like uh, it, it can give the GPU information and the GPU only knows pixels. Like it only knows I render things in parallel all at once. That's the only thing a GPU can do. A CPU is much more uh, sophisticated in a way. Uh, so for example, the CPU has what the resolution of your screen is. The GPU doesn't have access to that. And so you need to tell the GPU uh, what the resolution of the screen is by passing it as a uniform, as through, through this window. And basically the uniform is just like declaring it as a uniform, uniform is just telling the uh, GPU that this is information that's gonna be given to you from the CPU. Again, this is hidden from you in the, in the force. It's not hidden from you in Shader Place. Like I just kind of have all the uniforms. Because Shader Place is like more, it's like more like stupid. So, <laughs> so it doesn't like do anything fancy. Um, and so like, you know, you, you declare it up here as a global and you say uniform, there it is. And then in the, in the force, it's, it's up there, but you just can't see it. But you're, you're, you can see what kind of uniforms you have access to in this function reference. Okay, great. And so, we're gonna get the pixels position. We're gonna say vec2. Oh, right, I have to go over variables. Ooh, exciting. I mean, um, types. Who here, when I say type, who here knows what I mean? Type. Yes, we're at Carnegie Mellon. Cool. <laughs> 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 uh, 
we're adjacent to <laughs> computers <laughs> coding. Um, uh, so for just a refresher on what a, vari what a type is, is when you're talking to a computer about data, it's really helpful for humans to describe what kind of data you are talking about, mostly for yourself to understand later and for other programmers, but then it also tells the computer how much space to allocate, uh, how much space to take up on the, uh, on, like the, on like the RAM or the, you know, on the memory and stuff like that. So, so every single variable in GLSL needs a type. And so uh, in GLSL, there are four very, four most important types. There's a float, a vec2, vec3, and a vec4. Basically, these are all containers for numbers. So a float is a container for, for like one number. Uh, you could say float, let's call this uh, f, vec2, I mean is a 0 0.2. And you don't have to write this, I'm just kind of doing this to, to illustrate. Uh, vec2, let's call this v2 equals vec2. I'm just showing you the, the, the syntax of it all. Uh, vec2, let's do 0 0.4, 0 0.2. And then VEC3, V3, VEC3, uh, let's say 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.9. Notice I'm like using uh, everything between 0 and 1 because like I said, colors are between 0 and 1. Uh, V4 equals VEC4, 0 0.2. Actually, I'm just gonna say 0 0.1. This is shorthand for everything is the same. Everything is 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And I can visualize each of the things that I wrote by putting it in the output. So glfrag color, so this is the color that I'm telling the pixel to be, the final, the final, uh, the final color <laughs> uh, is a vec4. A vec4 is, a, again, a container for four numbers. Specifically, it's a container for a red value, a green value, and a blue value. And then the last value is alpha, but we can ignore it here because there's nothing behind the, the, the fragment, as just like just like in Hydra. So uh, let's let's visualize some of these these numbers that we made. So uh, I can just put f f in here. So I put my floating point number in a vector four, and that casts it as a vec four. So this is a gray because every single channel is 0 0.2. So if I were to make this zero, it would be all black. And if I were to make this one, it would be all white. Um, I can visualize this V2 um, by putting it in the first part so that the first two bins of this, of this VEC4 is filled up. And then I can put two different floating point numbers in the next. Like it can be the one that we defined. It can be a new one. So I can put like one. And so this is like, okay, so it's, a, it's kind of red and less green and not blue at all. So it's this kind of like brown color. And then V3, we can just, like anything that like adds up to V4 inside of, inside of a vec, inside of like any kind of these variables, as long as it adds, adds up, it's valid. So we can say V3, which is, this is a lot of R, red, oh, a little bit of red, a little bit of green, and then a lot blue. Does this, does this make sense? Yeah, okay. Is this, okay, good, I just wanted to give a little, Yes, yes, exactly. So the first three numbers is, is this right here, and this is the R, G, and B, and then this is the alpha. So you can actually make this zero and it won't have any effect. I, I, I think in the way that Sean wrote this, he discarded, he discards the last value and then uh, just replaces it with one because we know that in, in this context, there's no use case of having any other color, have it be any other number. Like it's Make it, you make it your favorite number. Make it like a little diary, you know? Uh, I, I think I've been liking 1576, no, 1529, uh, which is the, the smallest number that can be uh, made from three, oh crap, what was it? Anyways, it's, it's, it's a special number. It's not just any random number. Uh, okay, uh, and yeah, so and so forth. Do we, do we understand types a little bit? Oh yeah, Will. 
Yes. It depends on the editor that you're using. So some some aren't, and you can just say like seven, and then you know the c interpreter will understand that you mean a float. But in most, uh, yes, you have to put a we have to put a dot. And uh, but but interestingly enough, uh, if I were to have one here, oops, if I were to have one here, it doesn't care about the decimal points when it's inside of a vec two, even though these are all floats. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, and, and, and of course, like, you know, other uh, folks who are, are more familiar with data types, you can also do like integers and which are whole numbers and other types of variables that are common in C. And you might have noticed, but I've been tricking you into learning C today. Yes, this is all C syntax. So I know, yes, this, so any kind of this, if it looks familiar, it's because it's very similar to C. <laughs> I mean, it's basically, it's modeled after C. It's like C on the GPU, uh, as opposed to C on the CPU. Dang, they should have just called it G. <laughs> oh, no, that's G code. Okay. Um, great, okay. Okay, so let's, let's, let's look back at um, our, what we're trying to write here. Okay, so now we understand a little bit about like how, ooh, I'm gonna stand up a little bit. Now we understand a little bit how shaders work. Um, if so let's take a look at this and try to imagine what's going on here. Now that we understand a little bit about the context of like how shaders work. So in this sketch, we see that all of the colors are broken up into the red channel, green. Uh, all the colors are either red, blue, or green. Like there's no fancy color mixing. So you know that there's gonna be, uh, all the different channels are gonna be defined by like a certain function, right? And so let's start, let's start with the red channel. And we see that the, the red channel is this kind of sweeping, like sweeping um, line that, that, that goes across the screen from the center. Or the sweeping like angle. And so if we wanted to do that, uh, well, we can start to, I'm just gonna, gonna try, I, yeah, float, okay, so float R, let's define uh, floating point number that starts with R uh, equals, and we're starting to write the, the checkpoint now, so we're at like checkpoint negative one. Uh, floating, the float R equals, um, let's say, so when, when we're looking at this, we, we notice that it's not really like an X and a Y format, right? It's, it's radial, it's radiating from the center. And so what that means, when you, look at, when you look at a shader that's doing something like that, that means that you need to work in a polar coordinate system instead of a Cartesian. A Cartesian means X and Y, and then like a, like a grid, and polar coordinate means a width from a center, uh, a, a distance from the center, and an angle. So you can access any point on the screen given a distance from a center and an angle, the same way that you can access any point in the screen given an X and Y coordinate. And we're, we're coming to the, the most difficult part of the shader workshop, which is uh, we're gonna be doing a little bit of math to convert, yes, I got a, I got a little hands up. Um, we're gonna be doing a little bit of math to, to translate between X and Y to polar coordinate. Yeah, cool. Who here? Uh, who grew up in, an, I guess, an American education system, remembers Sokotoa. Oh yeah, we got some nods, cool, yeah. <laughs> and so if we, if we remember Sokotoa, <laughs> it's um, basically how you convert from angles in a triangle to the length of the different sides of the triangle, right? So, Katoa. <laughs> so we, we, start, we start with, um, we, 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 so in, in our shader coordinate, the X and the Y position looks a lot like the two sides of a triangle, right? So you're, eight, you're adjacent and you're opposite. So if we wanted to get the angle that a pixel has from the center, we wanna use, we, wanna, we know we wanna use tan because we have access to that information. We have access to the adjacent and the opposite, so the, the pixel's X and the Y position. So. Uh, but tangent 
basically gives you, so if you do tan of the opposite over adjacent, it gives you the angle. Oh no, it gives you, I'm sorry. If you, give, if you have tangent of the angle, it gives you the uh, ratio of the opposite over the adjacent. And to do the opposite, we're gonna need to do uh, a tan. So the a tan, uh, it's given the opposite and, and the adjacent of a triangle, it gives you the angle. This is, again, this is, the, this is the hardest part of the shader, I mean, of this shader workshop. So we're gonna first define, instead of defining R, let's just say zero for now, and then R, oops. Okay, so uh, we're gonna define an angle. So angle, float, equals a tan. Oh, and we need to get our x and our y position because uh, uh, the force doesn't have that set up for you already. So let's, do, let's get our x and our y position. So vec2, uh, let's call this position pos equals gl frag chord divided by resolution. And then it's mad at me. Oh, it's with a capital F. Okay. Okay, so this right here, this position, is uh, again, like I said before, this is the, uh, the pixel's x and y position divided by the resolution on the screen so that you get it between zero and one. And if, you're, you know, if you wanted to just double check everything we've talked about before, you can put this inside of, um, you can put this inside of your uh, final color output and get the, the gradient that we talked about before just to, I guess, do a sanity check. Great, so we have our position. Now our angle, we're gonna try to get our angle using a tan, just like we said, and uh, we can do that by saying position dot y over position dot x. Or, because a tan is a uh, an overloaded function, which just means that you can use it in different ways. You can also uh, say position.y over a comma position.x. And this is slightly different from if you were to divide it, um, but we can get into that later of how, but we're gonna use the comma. Just They're, they're not very different, but I, it looks slightly better if you use a comma. And so now we can, we can visualize the angle here. Oh, cool, wow. Well, this, is now an angle from not the center of the screen, but the bottom left-hand corner. Can anyone tell me why it's radiating from the bottom left-hand corner instead of the center? Oh, yes. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So the in, in, the, in graphics world, the zero, zero point is in the bottom left-hand corner, which is kind of different from a lot of other different graphics worlds, like I think in, like if you're rendering out an image, like zero, zero is like the top left-hand corner. Um, and so specifically in GLSL, zero, zero is always in the bottom left-hand corner. And so if we wanted it to be in the center, all uh, for zero, zero to be in the center, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna subtract 0 0.5 from X and Y. So position dot, uh, position equals, so we redefine position, position minus vec two, of 0 0.5. Great, now we see that the center is in the, is the, that the angle is radiating from the center. Um, in GLSL, this is, it's canonical that, uh, and just easier to work with the numbers, if all of the, uh, if, if the position on the screen ranges from negative one to one. And right now, it's ranging from negative 0 0.5 to positive 0 0.5. And so if we wanted to have it range from negative one to one, we just have to multiply that by two. And you will see this everywhere, everywhere. So if you go to, if you go to Shader Toy, which is a very popular uh, uh, shader sharing online platform, which I link in the webpage, you will see something like this, where it is just in, in the beginning of most shaders. Just because it's, it's very, it's a lot easier to, to, to think about uh, things from the center of the screen as opposed to the bottom left. Any, any like verbose shader, any kind of folk, folks who are like trying to play code golf, they, they, don't, they don't do that, this kind of thing. Okay, 
So now we have our uh, position that's in the center. Uh, you, we, we, we now have, have our angle going from uh, a negative number on the left going uh, up, up until the, 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 the top side of the screen where it's positive. And you may notice that uh, uh, when you put in a negative number into GLSL, it just interprets everything as, uh, as black. So anything that's like below zero is all black and anything that's above one is all, is all white. So you never have to worry about uh, having like it crashing because you went out of range for the, for the data. Okay, so we have our angle. If we wanted to recreate this kind of red pattern right here, you, we, we, we see that it's moving. And when you see something moving in a shader, your immediate thought should go, oh, that's using time, the time interval. So um, if we want our red channel to be, uh, so we know, we know we're gonna be using time somewhere. And like I said, uh, uh, shaders only register color between zero and one. Time is an ever-increasing number. It starts at zero when you start the scene, it's just in it's ever increasing. So if we were to just put time in here, it would just be white because it just has passed one for a long time ago. Um, and so to kind of bring back time to a range where we can see it, you can put it in a sine wave. This is one, this is a canonical way of like kind of restraining time so that so that it, you can see you can see things moving, how to animate things. Great. So, in in our uh, in in inside of this sine wave, you can start doing you can start adding things. So, uh, to kind of get this radiating movement, we add angle. So now we have this kind of sweeping effect across the screen. Because basically, we're saying as the sine of time plus, plus angle, this is how it kind of changes, or this is how you can render this kind of effect. Is there any questions about that? Oh, Lawrence, did you have a question? Oh, the time swipe? Oh. That's, this is a great segue into debugging in shaders. Oh, yeah. So you may be wondering, how do I, if I'm running into a problem, how do I debug? So, okay, great. Okay, so you, in, in shader programming, you don't have the option to, to print because printing is a function in, uh, that's run on the CPU. So in GLSL, you have to debug using colors. Um, but you do get you do you do get errors. So one way to view the errors that you that you're that you're going to get is if you uh, bring your mouse down to the bottom of the screen, you can t toggle debugging right here, and you click on the bug, which is the second icon from the bottom left. And what that does is that if you're having an error, this little X will show up, and you can mouse over it. And then it'll tell you, oh, FY is illegal vector field selection. Great. Are we are we all are we all good or should we have yes. great. What was the what was the issue? I'm using the Oh yeah. I know it's C syntax. Yeah. yeah. It's it's a pain for sure. And and on another thing, okay, let me introduce you to the my least least favorite bug in GLSL, which is this. Okay, so if we look at this, and let's say I have like comments of, you know, so and so forth and all this stuff, I'm, and I notice that there's, there's, a, there's a bug on this, on this line, and so I go over to the line, and then it says float, syntax error, and I'm like, what a, this is, this is the most pristine line of code I've ever seen. Float? How could float be wrong here? And so you try other things, and you're like, well, maybe angle is like a you know globally defined thing, and you go and Stack Overflow is like, you need to restart your computer, throw it out the window, <laughs> and then. But when that starts happening, you start feeling like you like you're just like bonkers. Just look above. The previous line was the problem. 
Yes, because because you didn't you need to have a semicolon after every single line. That's what happened to me. You did? Yes. Oh my god! I was like, "What's wrong with my line is getting it's me like, an X?" Yes. And there's nothing freaking wrong exactly. with that. And it like and then above it, yeah. I didn't have a semicolon. Yeah, the freaking semicolon gets you every time. It still gets me. I've been doing this for a while. Gosh, I started doing this in 2017, so like six years. Uh, oh, question? Yes. Yes. I'm, I think it does. Yeah, it does eventually. Does it? I think in some programs it does. Maybe some programs that check for it to overflow, it does. I don't know if it does in GLS. I've never had the window open that long. Yeah. So it's, it's up to the, the person who built the scaffolding around your shader program if it overflows or not. That's the answer of the question. Um, and if it wasn't abundantly clear, every single shader program needs scaffolding around it. Shader programs can't run by themselves because they're just running the GPU and the GPU is dumb. So it needs like a CPU program to like nest it. So that, that's, that's why I'm always talking about shaders like shaders and touch designer shaders and Unity shaders on, your, on the web. Anyways, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Great, okay. So we, we got our, we got our sweeping, our sweeping um, light ray going across the screen. Yes, I see some, yes, I see it. Wow. Um, and just to show you the difference between the, the, if you divide it and if you use the comma, the division, it introduces a um, discontinuity and the comma, it just kind of corrects for that. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know anything beyond that, unfortunately. Okay, so now we have our red channel. <coughs> Excuse me. Our green channel is this kind of like green, um, these green rings that are oscillating from the center. So, we're gonna use another math function. Yeah. So, this, the, remember how I said like polar coordinates are, uh, are the angle and the distance from the center? These rings are using the distance from the center to color themselves. So, uh, we're gonna be using Pythagoras theorem. Shout out Pythagoras but it's a function that's built into GLSL called length. Okay, so we're gonna say um, float b equals length. And we wanna get the, the distance from the center of the screen. And so we're gonna say the length of the, of the position. So uh, if we, I just need this as a triangle. So uh, what length does is it takes a, the x coordinate and a y coordinate and just gives you the, the length of the, uh, of the hypotenuse, uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You, you could actually, you could, write the, you could write out length. You could say like um, how you do squaring in GLSL is you do pow and then two, uh, and then you do position dot x, and then pow of position dot y, uh, two, and then you put that in, in a square root, which is just basically the power of both of those things, uh, 0 0.5. And it's mad at me. Oh, it's plus, droop. Okay, great, and so if we just visualize B right here, it's, it's the same thing if I used length, which is basically this is visualizing, given any pixel on the screen, like I am a pixel, what is my distance to the zero, zero point? And so here in the center, that pixel is, is, uh, is on the zero, zero point, so the distance is zero, and so it's black. And on the edge of this uh, circle that is radius one and beyond, the pixels are all white because the distance is more than one. Does this make sense? Great, okay, I got some nods. Okay, so uh, let's bring this back to where we can understand, it's, it's more readable, so the length of position uh, B, and we see here that it's this kind of, the, it's moving again. So we know that, that time and sign of time is in, incorporated somehow. Uh, oh no, this is G, not B. Apologies about that. Uh, okay, so we want, we, we, we want this to be moving, so we, we know that, that time is gonna be added and we know that uh, 
that we have to put sign around time so that it is between zero and one. And we see al already it's this kind of, like we see that it's moving and it's radiating inwards. If you want to be radiating, radiating outwards, you have to subtract time. And this is a little bit confusing because you, you think about things radiating outwards and you think about them getting bigger. And so you're like, okay, why, why is it when I subtract it, it seems like it's getting bigger? It's because you have to think in terms of the pixel's perspective. Or like that, that quote that I said before, you think in terms of the, the time frequency and the vibration. So like if you were a pixel on a screen and you want it to be uh, like, if you wanted to have the colors moving outwards, you would almost have time be shrinking in so that the, uh, so that the, the f so that you, so it perceives that it's moving outwards, if that, if that kind of makes sense. Like similarly, if you wanted to move everything to the left, you would actually say position dot x plus uh, a small number, and then it would move, uh, it would move to the, uh, the others. Hold on a second, why is that? Oh, plus equals, sorry. So if you wanted to move things to the, to the left, you would have to add, because from the perspective of the pixel, if you wanted to move, like if, if you were, if, you, if a camera was looking at you and you wanted from the camera to be perceiving you moving to the left, you would move to the right. So if that, that kind of, that analogy makes sense. Great, okay. We notice here that the, the, fr the frequency of the green rings is higher. Um, and again, you might think that, okay, if, if I was a pixel, I wanted the, the, to go through this sine wave radiating outwards faster, you would multiply, you would multiply your position. Let's say multiply it by 10. And so there, therefore you're going through this sine wave faster. Um, and so let's, let's combine our red channel and our green channel here. And then we can just do zero for blue. Great, okay. Do we, oh I see we have some we, we have some rings going outwards. How are, how are folks doing? Oh, we got rings, rings, anyone else? Okay, great, we're almost through this, this first checkpoint. This is the hardest checkpoint. The other things are, are way more fun. Getting all the hard stuff out of the way, all the math. Um, is there any kind of place where people feel stuck? I see some folks are already playing around with the numbers. I love that. Okay, so before, before, before I lose your attention, let's just go try to get this, this, this last blue channel. So the blue channel is, a, is going to be a combination of, of both of these things, because we see that the blue is kind of radiating outwards as well as oscillating from side to side according to the angle, and so you, can, so you can think we're gonna be using the distance from the center as well as the angle. So, float B equals, uh, let's say, sine of length, or sine of uh, angle plus length of the position plus time. So you can actually put this in, in different orders and you would get different patterns, but any kind of, as, as long as like there's a sign across the whole thing and, uh, and time is added within the sign function, you're, you're gonna get something that looks kinda nice. And so here, uh, and you probably wanna increase the frequency. Great, and so here we actually ended up with a spiral. So if we were to actually switch these, this one, or if we were to put the angle on the inside, we would get like a different, different look. Yeah, you get these kind of different looks. So you can, you can kind of play around with the, with the B value. Great, okay, I'm seeing some, some great shaders from everyone. Cool. Um, okay, so now we have, we finished our first checkpoint. Um, again, you can see the checkpoint code and in here, and another thing is um, all of the things that I said over the microphone are comments in this checkpoint code. So, uh, you know, again, if you wanted to come back to this workshop and revisit the checkpoint, 
everything that I said is, or mo the, the gist of everything I said is within these comments. Great. Any questions about the first? Yes, yes. You can also cop copy paste it too. Or I can show you this one. This is a little harder to see. There. And from here, you can start playing around, around with these numbers. Like if you were to increase the frequency of this, what would that look like? Um, and if you were to like divide by 10 instead of multiplying by 10. Cool, cool. Let me check the time. How are we doing on time? No. Oh. <laughs> All right, we're gonna get through the next checkpoints very quickly. Does anyone still need this code? Cool. And just a reminder, we started like 20 minutes late. So. Got it, okay, cool. Did anyone run into interesting bugs or interesting patterns? Like if I were to make this number so big, what would happen? Oh wow, how does that happen? Interesting, oh. I mean what if I were to make this number bigger? Kind of get these interesting like Morier patterns. It's because the, this is technically aliasing because the frequency that the pixels are, or the, that the color that we're telling the pixels to be is oscillating at is, is a higher frequency then there are even pixels. And so it creates these Morier patterns as an interference pattern. That's, that's, why, that's why these come up. Or if you were to like multiply by time, you probably get interesting Morier patterns that move. <laughs> um, and again, if, if at any point, uh, like you, you wanna, you just wanna kind of skip ahead, because I know some people like typing along and some people just like seeing the code on their computer. Again, you can just copy and paste this inside of, inside of the force and then you get, you get the same thing. Um, and how you get there again is it's linked on, if you go to sharstyles.com slash shader, the checkpoints and then the, the gist code for the checkpoint zero is where we're at. Okay, can we move, it was everyone all, all good? We got some thumbs up? Great, oh wow. Okay, cool. Okay, so here, it's, it's not very fun to, to think about shaders, everything in terms of red, green, and blue. Um, it's more fun to think about color in terms of color palettes and color as a function of as a function that we can traverse through to get different smooth color interpolations. So one way to do that is using something called cosine palette. This is just one option to create a different palette. Um, and it's my favorite and it's, a, it's kind of a can canonically favored by a lot of shader writers. And it's, uh, it's this function right here, cosine palette, and all it is is a, it's just a cosine that has all of these different kind of hooks that describe the shape of the cosine. So uh, if we remember in math class, if you were to multiply a variable that's inside of the cosine, it increases the oscillation. If you were to add something that's inside of the cosine, it'll change the phase at where it's at on the number line. Uh, contrast outside of the cosine function will stretch the function in the y-axis and brightness will move it on the y-axis. And I have this visualized. Uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you go to this graphing calculator link that is also linked uh, here. So it's linked in the checkpoint code as well as under tools. If we go to that function, to that link, we will see this is the cosine function graphed out. It's basically just three cosines but one for each channel. So, 
we have for the in this in this graphing calculator you have to uh, have all of your variables be one letter um, so for uh, for different variables so this is the the brightness variable for the red channel and if we look here the brightness is what's added on uh, the the last thing that's added outside of the cosine palette um, and then B is the I just named it a B C D B is the second variable it's for the uh, contrast and so you can imagine the color being more contrast uh, as because it, it oscillates between the different colors very fast and then C which is the the phase which is inside of the cosine you can see that it oscillates through the color palette faster and the cosine palette the input for it is this float T. And float T is like where you are in the number line to describe where you're at in the color palette. And so for example, if T was, uh, let's go back to the, yes, if T was zero here with this particular configuration with all these values here, if T was zero, it would be a very green color um, because it's, there's a lot of green channel here, there's a little bit of blue and there's no red. And if you go, like if T was time and then after one second, the color would be, would be equally green and red, which is yellow in GLSL because it's additive, and then not very blue. And then uh, if you go to so and so forth, so uh, you can oscillate through a, a color palette like that. Um, so I'm actually just gonna copy and paste the function because uh, we're a little low on time instead of writing it out. And I got the function again from the, from the checkpoint code. So how, how are we gonna use this function? So we see here that this function returns a vector three, and that's defined at the beginning of the function. And uh, we have to put it above our main function because GLSL is run in sequence. So every single, so if we were to put it at the bottom, the code in main would, wouldn't know that it exists. So let's define a vector three uh, called color right here. And then instead of assigning it the R, G, and B values, we can assign it uh, a co to, to a function co calling cosine palette. And then we have to define all the variables that are inside of here so that we need to pass it in. Because every single function is like a little machine where this is describing the input to the machine right here and then this is the output of the machine. So the input of this machine is again our, our t value, so where we are in the number line. The brightness, which is a vector three, so this is how, for every single vector, how, uh, where it should lie on the y-axis, so how bright it should be. The contrast, which is how stretched out it is on the y-axis, so how much the color varies through time. The oscillation, which is the frequency along the x-axis, and the phase, which is the position on the x-axis. Okay, um, so let's define all of those, those inputs right above the function where we use it. So vec3. Uh, let's just call this B, oh no, brightness, equals vec3, and then uh, let's just not, let's make it like not very bright. Let's just like 0 0.2. 0 point, let's say, let's have the contrast be 0 point. You can make, you can choose different numbers that I'm using. Uh, I'm just choosing numbers that I think will look good. Uh, vec3 oscillation. Uh, 0.2, one, and then our phase. Let's just say 0 0.2 for all of them, or let's say 0 0.92. Okay, great. And so let's have, uh, for this cosine palette, let's just have the, the T variable be time, and then fill in all of the inputs to our function. Great. 
Oh, right. So, and it outputs a vector three. So um, we need to put our final output has to still be a vector four. Great, and so this is the kind of color palette that, that we're gonna be using, and I'm just showing it uh, through just time. So it's like, it's like we're going through this, co this color palette, <laughs> just like heading it face on, going straight forward through time. But if you wanted it to, to like view it through space, we can do things like adding um, uv.x or position.x. And we see that now we're going through the, the uh, now it kind of looks like Hydra. <laughs> you can, now we're going through the color palette, but through the x-axis. And uh, you can see in our final checkpoint, we are in the color checkpoint, we use, we're using all of the different functions are the different variables that we defined for each color channel in different ways. Um, so you can just kind of like play around and like put like f like put uh, like you know R in here like times R, R in the oscillation and see what happens, or B in the oscillation. Oh, that looks crazy. Or let's put it in contrast. Great, and so we see that the contrast is now being defined by the, the, blue, or the, the blue channel that was formerly the blue channel. Great, cool, we got through the second checkpoint. This one was much easier than the first one. How are we feeling? Excellent, is everyone feeling a little, a little tired? after all that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, you know, shaders are hi high risk, high reward. <laughs> and now, yes. Oh, there's bugs, wonderful. We love bugs. So the gist, the force, so let me copy and paste the whole thing and see what kind of bugs that we might be encountering. Okay, yeah, I think it's... The, the top part? Oh, I see, I see. You mean like cosine palette? Oh, understood, understood. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little, it's a lot more verbose. Great, okay, cool. Are we, we're all, we're all kind of where we wanna be? Ooh, the screens are looking cool. Oh, I'm so excited, okay. Okay, so now, we're past the hardest part. We, now is the kind of time where, um, I want to, there's a fork, there's a fork in the road in this workshop. Yeah. Um, the fork in the road is between a couple things. So we can go over, someone mentioned SDFs over there. We can go over what an SDF is because it's a precursor to making a 3D world. Uh, we can go over moving <laughs> moving, moving around. We can go over back buffer um, or, or any kind of other optional thing folks had in mind. Yes, question. Exactly, yeah, that's what back buffer is. Yeah, back buffer SDFs, dang, <laughs> tall order. <laughs> One thing I, I also want to show uh, folks is uh, when I say sticker sheet uh, under tools, I want to show you what I mean. So under tools on the uh, workshop page, if we go here, we open it up, uh, we see a bunch of functions. 
And each of these functions, like if you were to copy and paste this code into the force, it, uh, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't show anything because each of these functions are meant to be copied and pasted in before your main function and then used in your main function. So for example, uh, this, this uh, if we wanted to use this BPM function, basically, so this, this is something that takes in a BPM and then it creates a spiking uh, variable across time for that BPM. So if you, were to be, if you wanted to do visuals, you copy the whole thing, make sure you get the last bracket, and then you paste it in above your main function. Oh, and then another thing is that the, the sticker sheet right now is, because I usually teach this in shader place, the uniforms are slightly different. So everywhere where it says time, you're gonna have to just, or U time, you're just gonna have to change it to time, unfortunately. And same with like pi, like if you see pi and then the, the editor's mad at you, you just have to change it to 3.1415, whatever many digits you know, <laughs> pi. Um, so, so if I wanted to use this function, I then highlight get BPM viz, and then uh, I put, I declare a floating point variable Let's just call this like BPM. And then uh, let's say like 120, is that like a good BPM? Uh, and it gets a floating point number and then we can use BPM, let's say, let's have it be used in our brightness, in our just our red brightness. And we see now it's going to be uh, flashing at that BPM. Cool. Any questions? Any, any anyone running into any bugs? Cool. Okay, so coming back to the fork in the road. Is there anyone who's who's more interested in, in uh, shapes, like adding in SDFs? So sh in different shapes, you can, or okay, there's actually three things we can do. We can do shapes, we can do space modulation, or we can do uh, back buffer. Okay, so I'm gonna, back buffer, which is this kind of like feedback, uh, fee or yeah, it's like using like the previous frame to create feedback, yes. Oh, explain them. Yes. So adding shapes is like being able to like define a triangle and then putting a triangle on the screen and then moving it around um, or like a circle. And this, this one is uh, interesting because you don't define shapes by saying th there's like, you, you don't define shapes by sh to saying that there's a circle here and you tell the circle where it's gonna be. Instead, you define shapes by describing a pixel's distance from where it is to the surface of the shape. So it's this kind of like vectorized way of, of looking at shapes. It's like, um, it's like, you know, in like Photoshop where you have, where you can convert between vectors and rasterization. It's like this, like usually we're used to like rasterizing shapes and using shapes like, okay, circle stamp here, but with SDFs, you describe it, it's like a mathematical function. So that's, uh, that's shapes. And it also is like a precursor to creating 3D shapes. Because once you, is it's very easy to add a third dimension to your shapes after you define them. Um, modulating space is, uh, is being able to uh, use these functions here like M P mod one, P mod mirror one, mod single one. So these uh, can change uh, repetition of space because that's a very unique thing about shaders is that uh, you can very easily repeat things without adding any much more like computation. It's not, it's not that much more computationally intensive to repeat shapes instead of uh, as opposed to other like graphics rendering uh, softwares. So PMOD polar, like if we were to use this one, um, 
I'll show you just, just what it looks like, because I, I won't explain it, because then that's basically, we will be doing it. Oh, it's, it's already radial, so. <laughs> here. Right, so like so this is something that's like modulating space um, in, the, in a polar way. So you can have different amounts. Or we can just play around. I wanted to present some tips going forward. Because like I said, I want you to be able to come back to this page and pick up some of the things that didn't really make sense the first time. Because the best way to learn shaders is to go home and sleep. And then the next day, look at it again and then sleep again. And just do completely, just do a shader sleep sandwich. And then that's honestly the, the best way to learn. I can't. If that, that, so there's, there's actually two things I want you to learn from this workshop. Input is pixels position and the output is the color and sleep shader sandwich. So, um, so this is specifically tips for, um, for uh, doing like vi uh, live code visuals, uh, which some of you might be doing tomorrow. I don't know if we went over this. Did we talk about this yet? Oh, got it. Okay, understood. But maybe in the future, future, yes, brave souls can can uh, step up to the open mic at the very short part of the end of the uh, show tomorrow, or uh, you can join the live code Discord and people, folks are would love to have new new folks on the lineup and stuff like that. But anyways, so for for doing um, visuals with uh, shader code, the human brain does a lot of work for you. Um, a lot of times folks will come up after, you know, uh, a show and say like, oh, what was that like fluid simulator you made? And I was like, oh, it's just like a back buffer, you know. Um, like, for example, I, I always love showing Joshua's light show um, because it's this layered of oil and paints in uh, overhead projectors. And this is what I think is like the original shader programming VJ code. It's so good. Um, documentation is everything. Sadly, we are poor digital serfs in the digital kingdoms of Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and thus are subject to their compression algorithms. I really wanted to just um, give you some documentation tips because shaders are so beautiful real time, and, and I don't want you guys to be, when it comes to sharing it, just be utterly disappointed and, and not experience the joy of sharing your shaders online because that's such a fun part, is the community of people who are interested in shaders and the different algorithms that you make. Um, and so I really want to just kind of speed run you to get to the point where you where you can have some uh, some oh, like nice looking videos to, to share with the with the community, um, and you don't have to you know or or yeah. So um, documentation tips: anything that's built for recording games is really good for recording shader visuals. Uh, just make sure to disable mic in when you are recording on OBS, because I've definitely posted some shaders where I'm just like like eating pasta like in the background. <laughs> um, and so this means I, I use OBS a lot, Open Broadcast Studio. Um, it's very quick to, to pick up. GeForce Experience and Xbox Game Bar, those are actually built into a lot of uh, Windows computers. Uh, OBS settings, this is by Aaron Taker Weiss. Uh, they, they made this very nice uh, window to show you exactly what how to capture uh, capture your, the uh, the settings so that you it's, it's very shareable online it doesn't completely obliterate your, your the outputs you make honestly sometimes it, especially with the really finer detail shaders it still might not come out great um, but yeah oh yeah and so for specifically for posting on Twitter which or X is the most which is the most aggressive compression. 
Um, here's here's the, uh, the settings for that. Again, these slides are linked in the strarstyles.com slash shader. And for images, a fun hack for Twitter is that you just add a transparent pixel and you save it as a PNG and then Twitter doesn't compress it. Just, just yeah, just a transparent pixel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if there's something that's like like something that that makes it so that it can't turn a PNG into a JPEG because it, if it has the opportunity, it will <laughs> to like obliterate your beautiful creation, which is really exciting. And then I have optional homework. Um, you know, because it's some, sometimes uh, you know it's it's hard to to think about like what some next steps are. Um, but one thing I really want you to think about is how shaders can serve you in your own practice or how, how they can enhance your, your own practice or, you know, because they, 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 they do exist in, you know, on the, on, in the force and, you know, the, the tools that we used, but there's, there's basically any computer can, almost any computer can run GLSL. And so it's very extensible and, you know, I want, I want y'all to think about um, using one of these templates or any kind of outside structure that's not the force um, color, you, like try to use shaders in a way that like kind of makes sense. And I want to use make sense kind of be interpreted very broadly. So like think about like, okay, what's something that you can do with a shader that you can't really do with a mesh? And so for example, a lava lamp is a great example of that because a lava lamp has the blobs and you can make a shader that makes blobs very easily as opposed to, uh, yes, well you could do two dimensional blobs if you, if you so desire because we, we didn't get up to three dimensions this time. Um, or you can make like like a like you could even like have like an image of like a soup pot and then have the shader be the soup that's inside of so everything 2D. I'm thinking of everything 2, 2D here. Um, uh, you can make like a washing machine where the window part is a is a shader because the you know as it turns on it's this. I mean this is basically you could just put the shader that we wrote in there. Oh not that one, um, but make it look like a washing machine. Um, and this is, you know, this is all meant to just encourage exploration. Um, and for continuing on shader, you know, shader education in your life, um, there's this really cool website called shader.zone. And this is started by Connor Bell and shader influencer Patricio Gonzalez Vivo. And it's basically a link to a Discord, but it's really nice because, uh, you know, it kind of brings you into a space where you have to read the rules before joining, which is uh, really, really nice to know that everyone did this before coming into the Discord, so it's not just like any kind of random, like if you were to Google like shader community Discord, like you would get a different kind of an environment as opposed to, this is a more like in, um, uh, place that encourages exploration and growth. Uh, so there's shader.zone. And then, oh yeah, Twitch stream, Curiously Minded. I think they started season four, so this is, this is my little brag. It was started by two of my former students who took a workshop, the, the, my shader workshop, and then they met when I did like the, the breakout Zoom rooms, and then they started a, a, a Twitch stream where they just get on together and then they write shaders together. <laughs> it's, it's so sweet, and I love it so much. And they, they have like, they, it's like freaking amazing. Like, I, like they have every single, uh, time they kind of focus on a specific skill that you learn. So when when I went on with them because they asked me to like they were like oh like you should come on and be be our guest. We specifically focused on like one shader function, and that was what the the you know the what kind of folks can like come come away with it. Uh, so I really recommend curiously minded. Uh, oh, and then if you like to learn based on a walkthrough online. The Book of Shaders is a beautiful, beautiful step-by-step -step guide on approaching shaders from so many different angles. Excuse me. Um, so it's, it's not, it's unfortunately not finished, but it's, it's so much, like so much of it is here. Like you can, uh, he, if, if you missed out on like, you know, us writing SDF functions, he has a whole chapter on that. Uh, it's made by Patricio Gonzalez Vivo and Jen, Jen Lowe, so they, they both worked on it. Uh, and so he talks, they, they, they talk about uh, different how to write shapes in GLSL and other beautiful GLSL happenings. 
And then, um, like I said, the GLSL is very mathy, and so just kind of like knowing general math things really helps um, writing shaders, and so a great resource for that is immersivemath.com. It's like this interactive 3D environment for learning different math things like linear algebra and dot product and cross product. Uh, oh yeah, three blue, one brown, which is, um, um, if yeah, maybe some of you already know this because it's very popular. Um, also a really wonderful uh, math YouTube channel, it talks about fractals and other things. Um, and yeah, and then I just included this like, this page that has easing functions. And if you click on each easing function, you can get the GLSL at the bottom and then use easing function. Yeah, great. And 324, we have six minutes for questions, or five minutes. Yes. I'm gonna hand the mic so oh, that everyone sorry. can hear <laughs> the questions. Uh, what about Shader Toy? Oh, Shader Toy, why didn't I mention Shader Toy? I just forgot. But, but like, how do you, like, I tried copy and pasting things into that editor and they wouldn't run. So right. I just wonder what you have to do to them to make them work. Exactly, so that is the biggest pain point for GLSL is that the uniforms aren't standardized. So the rest of the language is, but the uniforms are not. And so Shader Toy calls time a completely different uniform. Um, so for example, if we wanted this to run in the force, this is probably, okay, great, it's one page. Uh, it's just too big, I can't. Let's do a really simple one. Let me look up butterfly. It's gonna be like the most intense, GPU intensive butterfly. <laughs> Let's do, oh, circle. Very cool. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Robert. Simple Circle by John Auber. This looks similar. I think. <laughs> okay, we'll do Robert Circle. We need Robert Circle, please. His first one. This is so cute. Okay, this is this is now officially a thing. <laughs> oh no. God. Why? R O T A? R O T A. R O T A. Okay, great. L O. No O. And no space. No space. Come on, Robert Ruda. Oh, there oh, we go, Robert's Robert. first circle. <laughs> there we go. No, wonderful. This is a great example. It was worth the wait. <laughs> and more. I would probably wait another hour. For Roberts, really you're right, and it's and also I'm looking at it right away, and I'm like, yes, okay, great. Um, so first of all, main image, uh, main. Um, it's just like you're like I, I I can't unfortunately like go through like every single step, but I just want to show you really quickly, um, like what it just kind of like what it looks like. And so this one instead of frag cord, it's GL frag cord, and then I resolution to X Y is just gonna be resolution. And then it's still mad at me. Uh, oh, right, derp.xy. Great, and so we have, we passed the first one. And then I time here. Actually, one thing we can, I do sometimes is that I just define float I time equals time, and then every single time there uh, forward will be correct. And then UV, I changed UV because UV is already declared in, uh, and then I'm gonna do the same for resolution. UV is already declared in uh, the force. Uh, so I had to redefine it to POS. Yeah, so I just. Well, you could name it whatever you want. The only thing is that the, the force already has a function, already has a global function called UV instead of a variable, which is really unfortunate. And so instead of this being a uh, frag color, we're gonna do capital F, frag color here, and then it should work after this. Hey! Yay! So Robert it just it just kind of us. takes like a nice like it takes like a nice like combing through. Again, like I said, like this shaders are hard. They're really, really, really hard. And oh, this is because so the I time um, shader toy 
define its global variable for time is I time, and so it uses I time here and all the other places instead of time. So, so yeah. So I, I could have gone through and like every single instance. Oh, there's actually only one instance. <laughs> so I could have gone through and like converted every single one, but I just was lazy and I redefined it because it was missing. Yeah. I'm so happy you like it, great. Yeah, like I said, shaders are very, very, very difficult. It's like, it, it's a different way of thinking about, I mean, first of all, coding is hard. And this is a specifically difficult way of coding. So everyone like, you know, do a little, uh, in your mind, a pat on, on your back for, uh, for, you know, doing something very difficult. Okay, cool. Um, how's everybody doing energy-wise? Um, I'm still jet-lagged, so I'm like, it's like bedtime for me, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is kind of exciting for me because um, I've never given a hydro workshop that's also paired with a shader workshop. and. Um, it's very exciting because Hydra is written completely in shaders, and so every time you write a string of functions, it is g generating a shader. Um, and partly, I think when I made it, I was like interested in like making little pieces of shader code that I could reuse in different ways without having to remember how to, to do some common things over and over again. Um, and what's, what's exciting is then you can um, write your own custom shader. So all the functions, again, are just JavaScript functions, but they actually just generate a piece of shader code and basically the type of the function, so whether it's a source function like oscillator or whether it's kind of changing the color or changing the coordinates, um, the the type of the function determines kind of how it's put together um, when when Hydra generates the shader, um, and so you can actually write your own versions of all of these types. So you could write shader code that's just for combining colors together, like the blend functions do, or you could write one that's just for generating a pattern, like the source functions do, which is kind of most similar to what um, we were just doing in the workshop with Shar. So um, I don't want to go really deeply into this, but I just added to the pad a few resources for this, and I wanted to show you what those are and a little like what that looks like. So um, the first is this still kind of work in progress, but guide for writing your own GLSO functions. Um, and so, uh, one of the things here is a link to part of the Hydra source code. And this is actually just in the, in the source code for Hydra in general, there's a single file that contains the definition of all the functions. Um, and so, uh, like for example, well noise is a bit of a weird one. I'll just scroll down a bit. I mean, it's a bit like this is kind of going deep, but for example, oscillator, it's just actually defined here. And so here's the name of the function, here's the type, which I will uh, explain a little bit. Oops. Um, here are the inputs to the function, which is what we saw that you can put in parentheses. And those are actually um, changed into uniforms behind the scenes. Um, and then here's the GLSL code that corresponds to um, the, the um, uh, oscillator function. Um, and so uh, actually I just wanna go back to here. And so you can actually just see, if you write Hydra code, you can actually see the um, shader code uh, that, that's being generated by Hydra. And so for example, um, I'm gonna go click on this. Uh, there's, uh, Geika made an extension that makes it even easier to see the shader code. So um, 
in this show shader code using Hydro Debug, there's this example here, and so I'm gonna go there. Um, and what this does is it's loading like an extra JavaScript library. And um, when I run, so here it's making an oscillator, it's showing on the screen. When I run this code, it pulls up this other little window that has um, a shader in it. And you'll see like there's actually a lot of stuff here, but at the top, some familiar stuff like the time and resolution. And actually, you can ignore a bunch of stuff that comes. So there's all this stuff in the middle that are actually kind of utility functions that other things use, but they're actually not being used in this. Um, and if you scroll all the way down, um, basically the only code that's generating what you see on the screen is from here. So here's the oscillator function, here's the rotate function, and here's the main function, and it's then it's um, using the oscillator and the rotate function together. Um, and so you'll see, yeah, you'll see basically that what we were looking at over here, he, like here it had these inputs of flow, uh, frequency, sync, and offset, and those basically become the inputs to this um, shader function. Um, and so I think what can be exciting about this is say you're working with shaders and you come with, you find something that you really like, um, then what you can do is you can kind of add it as your own function in Hydra and then you can use it with other Hydra functions like um, uh, the other functions to blend things together um, and so uh, going back to this, I guess, this like kind of documentation, um, the way that you can define a custom shader function is using um, this set function. Um, and so here's one that's um, really similar to one of the things we were just looking at that's just a gradient. And so um, what this this is doing is based on the position on the screen, it's generating a different color. Um, and so anything that's converting a position to a color, just like we were doing in the fragment shaders overall, is a source function in Hydra. So it's like taking a position and generating a color from it. Um, and so this that's written here, and this is a bit like, I don't know, I think it's a bit, go th I've never done this in a workshop because I consider it kind of like minute details, but um, but it can be like maybe exciting if you um, are working with shaders also. Um, so uh, here it has like the name of it, which can be anything, like you can decide the name, the type of function that it is, um, the inputs and their default, default value um, and then, so this ends up generating a GLSL function that looks like this, that then Hydra, using its way of compiling things, it puts all, based on how you put the string together, it, it generates how it should use these functions. Um, and so, for example, here is like the live example of that. Um, and I will click here to open this in the editor. Um, and so here, uh, now I made my like gradient two function and um, it has this parameter speed because I was defining the speed. Um, I could like make it go really fast or something and that's going fast. Um, but then I could, uh, I could like, just, just to show you that this is actually working, like, um, just like we were doing before in the shader editor, I can just directly like input the RGBA values here. And so now it's red because I put that there um, or green. And then um, I can't remember. Maybe I'll put like sign of time. Let's see what happens. So it's like, like maybe I'll make this like cosine time 
Um, and so you can actually just directly write write shader code, like um, right in here, and you can call it whatever you want. Um, and then you could um, uh, apply other hyd hydro functions to it. Um, I'm gonna go back to the one that I had at the beginning, which was uh, this one. And then I could, after it, put like repeat or something. Um, and so, and I could do all the other things that we were doing before, but it, it gives you kind of finer control. And so people have made kind of libraries to do all sorts of things, but I think it could be explored much more. It hasn't been documented that well until recently. Um, and um, yeah, I think it can be really fun, especially, for example, to play with some of the blending modes. Um, like you could, uh, any function that you're interested in actually how it's working, like let's say um, I wanna make my own oscillator, so I could go here and, I'm gonna make it a little, I could copy the oscillator code, um, and then I'm gonna go back to the editor and paste it here. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit longer. And I could just redefine oscillator, but I'm gonna change it to like, now I'm gonna get to make the Olivia function that I didn't have before. So now I'll make the Olivia function and I'll do like um, Olivia. And so I just copied the existing definition of oscillator, which is here and you can see there's these parameters, frequency, sync and offset and stuff. Um, and here you can see there's like the red, green, and blue channel that are all doing different things based on the time and the, the coordinate position, which here is like STX. Um, and let's say I want the channels to behave a little differently, so I could, maybe here I'm gonna make it be like negative time. I'm gonna see what that does actually, I don't know. Oh yeah, so now it does like, the oscillator's like wah wah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so then you could like, I'm gonna make this slower because I always, um, it's too fast. <laughs> um, and then I could like also do, do other things to this or use it in combination to, with other things. Um, yeah, one that's also, here there's some examples of um, different kinds. So what we were just looking at is the source. Actually, that's the same as this example, I think. Um, and then color functions, they just receive a color and output a different color. So instead of the source functions, it's taking a coordinate and outputting a color. The um, color just receive a color and output a different color. Um, yeah, actually I could show this really quick. So. Um, oh, actually I'll do it like this. I'll just show, show this. I think it might be easier to see with the camera. So if I do, and like if I just do um, at source s zero dot out, um, there's the camera, and now there's this switch colors function and what it's doing it's like you can see it's changing this is like this weird GLSL thing where you can change the order of things just like that I think so now it swapped the channels and so um, yeah you can like do lots of complicated things using this and it kind of opens up a lot and um, what like some fun things like people have made kind of chroma key functions in this, which I think is a fun way of using it. Um, and also, we didn't look, um, we didn't look exact so much about making dynamic arguments. So if you want to make something like mouse reactive or audio reactive, um, you can uh, basically instead of putting a number somewhere, you can add a function there. Um, and so let's say, 
Uh, actually, I don't use this this often, so I like forget the syntax for doing these things. So I'm gonna look here. But let's say, okay, I'm gonna take this example. So uh, this example is doing a coordinate transformation. Um, and so I'm trying to think. Okay, so I'll just take this example. I know I'm showing a lot of things, but I just wanna give you a little taste of it. So um, I'll do this example from the, so this is a coordinate function. So they called it tan. Um, and so the regular oscillator looks like this, and then the tan is doing this thing. And if it's like, if I change this value here, let's see, it's like 0 0.2. Ooh, that was fast, okay. Um, let me go slower, uh, 20, okay. And I don't know what the second one does. Okay, well, um, so like, let's say I want this um, two value to be controlled by the mouse. Um, so what I could do is instead of that value there, I could uh, basically type a function, which in JavaScript you can do kind of a shorthand like this. And what Hydra is doing behind the scenes is it's like creating a uniform and passing in the mouse value for that. So here now you see this parameter of the shader code is being controlled by the mouse. Um, and so you could write um, um, in, in this, uh, the learning part of the documentation, there's this kind of sequencing and interactivity section, and that shows you how to use this to kind of create your own functions that could control an aspect of something. Um, and then if you use that with, with the shader thing, it could, like, basically you can define all of the inputs into, into a shader. Um, yeah, I don't wanna go super deep. Where did I have this? Okay, I don't wanna go deep into this, but I just wanted to, show you a little bit, and this is very exciting because now um, in the this dev branch with all these extensions you can load, you can see people have made different shaders that do different things, like um, there's some more blend modes and patterns and fractals that people have made little shaders to do kind of all these different things, and this is something um, I'm especially excited about, and if you're kind of interested in like, oh, I want to add these shaders um, that maybe you want to share with other people also in Hydra, this is like a great um, space also where you could add, like your name could be here <laughs> if you want to share stuff that you're working on with other people. So yeah, any questions? Yeah, so this is the secret, <laughs> secret but not secret dev um, link and um, I think okay I put it Hydra dev branch I'll add with extensions at some point it's going to be merged into the main one so you will see that but um, yeah Yeah, that's a good question. That part, um, so um, like GitHub is this place where you can store source code for lots of things. Um, and there's this repository called Hydra Extensions. And this contains kind of the list of all the links, but basically you have to store it in a JavaScript file somewhere that then can be loaded here and then when it's added here, it can like load it from your JavaScript file. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess I could explain this in more detail maybe if for people who are interested in this kind of thing, but yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Um, wait, what were we going to ask, though? Uh, yeah, it's a bit like mostly canvas elements. Basically, only canvas elements can be an input to the okay. Hydra thing. So it has to be, so like that's why P5 is really easy to use with it because it's already using canvas and same with um, 3JS, but not everything on the internet is a, uh, um, canvas. One thing that's um, what you could do that's kind of interesting is you you can have transparency of Hydra and if you have it like on top of everything and so it's like glitching out and obfuscating the things that you can see. Um, but yeah it could be fun if you like join the discord and like ask people. But yeah you can just use it as a library and then you can um, have there's some more flexibility around some parameters also when you use it as a library instead of in the built-in editor and stuff. And it works on mobile. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, um, lately I sometimes use it with this like little keyboard and like my phone. <laughs> um, also the camera works on mobile too. Um, yeah, if you make a sketch, you can also, I forget what it is, but if you say show code equals false, it hides the code. Um, and so then you can, if you share the link, you can just have a thing and like send it to people and open it on the phone, especially like using the camera or something. And then, um, yeah. Yeah, it's like, I think it's like, it's like show code equals false. It's a bit like that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so you add this. It's in the, it's, it's somewhere in here. <laughs> Um, oh, I think using the web, okay, so this is, all, this is all new. Using the web editor, there's like the key commands and the sharing with code hidden okay. section. Yeah. Um, okay, I wanna wrap up and turn it over to these other people, but thank you so much. And feel free, during the jam, we can like make shaders in Hydro or make shaders outside of Hydro or all the things. Well, we are transitioning to Sarah and Kate, who are getting, getting ready, seeing a peek behind the curtain. Well, so <laughs> the whole idea of this little segment here, uh, we were talking about this this morning, so that's why it's a little bit of a surprise, um, is we thought, now you guys know sort of how to make images, but sometimes we talk less about how we perform those things together. And so the idea with this is that Kate and I are going to basically talk through the beginning of a performance that we might do together, uh, just to sort of let you guys um, in on sort of the ways we think about performing and maybe it will help you come up with some ideas about how you wanna think about performing those things. Um, there's no rules, it's just one way of doing it. Lots of different people do it differently. So um, if you watch this and you're like, I would never do that in my life, that's cool. Um, now you know. <laughs> knowing what you're not gonna do is one step closer to knowing what you wanna do. Uh, let me make that one little bit bigger. So our system is my visuals are um, a tool I built called the Habra that I don't teach because unlike Olivia who put lots of effort into making things, into making things accessible for the community, um, I have put zero effort into making things accessible for anybody. Um, and step one is like install Java. So that's not usually how you wanna start a workshop. Um, <laughs> And so what it is, is it's an Electron app that I write SVG code for. I wrote this little uh, closure script thing. I find Lisp's an easy way to think about generating code, so that's why I used closure script. Um, and so, and the key part of this system is that it has a frame counter, and so I can refer to the frame, and it updates every 250 milliseconds, which is an eighth note at 120 BPM. 
That's a uh, live code math. You've heard about girl math and boy math. That's live code math. Um, How many BPNs is your frame rate? <laughs> <laughs> and so we're just going to sort of talk through. Yeah, maybe I'll say what you're not seeing <laughs> is um, what I'm doing. So I'm coding audio in Sonic Pi, which is another um, open source um, environment. It's sort of uh, based on Ruby. It's made by someone named Sam Aaron in the UK. Um, and it's basically, yeah, an interface that talks to Super Collider underneath. Um, so that's what I'm coding in right now that you won't see. Um, oh, just for a second. Yeah, go for it. This is it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, usually when you open it up, you get like a totally blank buffer. Um, yeah, it should just be like... Um, I think it's sonicpi.net, is that it? Something like that is where you can find it, I think. Um, um, and another, like, maybe thing, um, later in Sarah's process, she got really into um, the Fairlight synthesizer. Um, so another thing I started doing to sort of accompany that was bring in samples from other 80s synths around that time. So there's a couple of like external samples from some Roland synths um, at the top of my code. Um, that was like this intentional thing to try to match what Sarah was doing visually as well. Um, so there's a lot of that going on when we go back and forth is like, what is the other person doing? How, does, how do I feel about that? <laughs> how do I make that into something? Yeah. And a big part of this partnership, of course, is that we have practiced together a lot, and we don't use any audio reactivity that's computer driven. I think we both mentioned that a little bit before. I always say I'm audio reactive. I can hear, and I'm sitting next to Kate and she can see and is sitting next to me. And a big part of the practice is practicing together and sort of building that personal relationship while you're doing the rest of this stuff. Um, and we, so we actually gave a talk once called The Church of Cody because we used to do our rehearsals on Sunday mornings and that was our church. <laughs> and we've kept this up as we live in different places. I mean, we, so when we first met, we lived two blocks apart in Brooklyn um, and now Kate lives in Virginia and I live in Berlin and there was a third member of Cody for some time and she was still in Brooklyn so we would get on the web, we would get on Zoom and do the Church of Cody every Sunday. Um, and so the way that we start generally is because we're not audio back. reactive but we have this timer. Yeah. Oh good, I'm up. great, perfect. <laughs> and we have this timer is we want to sort of get things starting together. So first, I usually create a circle. And because I hate remembering things, um, I wrote snippets. This is still Adam, which is sort of dead, but it still runs in legacy. So, um, But it made it very easy. One of the nice things about Adam and a sad thing about VS Code and why you should never use VS Code and boycott Microsoft as much as possible is that they sort of captured it, and they've locked down the APIs, so you can't do as much fun stuff with it, and that's unfortunate. So I'm kind of just keeping my atom alive whenever possible. But so I want to make a circle. I wrote a snippet that shows me how to make a circle so that I don't have to remember what functions I wrote. So I'm going to start off really simple. We're going to make a white circle. And um, see, I wrote my own little things. So it's going to be half the width and half the height. So it'll be in the middle. And I'm going to give it a radius of, let's say, 200. That's pixels. Um, some of the numbers are I just vaguely know and guess from having done it before, uh, what, si what size and shape it should be. So you got saved, so now we have a circle. And then I'm watching this. <laughs> this is my part. And then I kind of like get a sense of how it's flashing, and I just kind of try to start a simple beep um, sample, like while I think it's on. So that's kind of working, like there's a beep every other, like, yeah, two be beeps yeah. per circle. And so then I <laughs> might say, I have this big function here that this is one of the ones I don't rewrite every time that cycles through colors. And I know that because I've worked with Kate before, um, there's going to be another beep coming. I've also heard music. There's another beep coming. 
And because the circle <laughs> is on every other beep, I can change, let's say, the background color. And it's changing every four because it's listed four times. I am a computer coding genius. <laughs> and so I know another beep's going to come. Where's my beep? Ooh, what'd I do? This is the fun part. Okay, or we don't usually make our error this soon, but that was good. So then I might be like, hmm, maybe I want another shape. There's gonna be more beeps. There's also gonna be some wobbly noises. I don't know which one's gonna come next, so that's always why I have to like take a risk, you know? Um, I have animations that basically the way it works is I can define the animations on the fly or previously. And so sometimes I just have them sitting in there. So in case Kate's gonna start making some crazy noises, maybe I'll get one uh, queued up. So we'll queue up move me six. I'm not sure if I remember which one that does, but, oh, see, now I made an error too. So I just changed the rhythm of my beeps a little bit, but it's still, cause Sarah has like several things flashing, it still kind of works. Right, and I can add other backgrounds if I'm like, oh man, it's taking me a while to think of the other stuff that I want. Um, so now this background has patterns in it and it changes more quickly. So we got this going on. Yeah, and Sarah has that like rotating dot thing. And she mentioned the whooshy thing. So that, that yeah, I'll make some kind of whooshy sound. That, um... I'll have to add another shape while she's doing that. I'll have to do a good rectangle. Make it pink. I want it pretty high, so because I don't like to type things out, I'll do half width and then just change the value so it's at point two, so it's higher. The height. And I think we need some bassy sound, or that's pretty bassy, but like some more. I like bass. <laughs> I am also a big bass fan. And then I made these shapes, but they're going at the same time, right? Because they're both coming every fourth frame. But I don't want that. I want there to be a little bit of syncopation. So let's just say every third frame. Um, we need to pull this over because it started at half width, but then it drew from the left. So 0.4, how's that? I don't really remember what this bass sample sounds like, so I'm gonna add it in slowly. <laughs> Yeah, it's always very important to uh, add your samples uh, slowly. Oh, that's a pretty good one. I'm gonna add that in much faster. So now I'm looking at, these are animations I've previously defined that I like leave up here. And then at some point I get sick of them and delete them all and try again. But right now we've got some, so that reminded me, SC Cirque is a fun one. That'll also go with this bassy noise because I don't really feel like my animation is super bassy right now. So I think SC Cirque should be like a big throbbing circle. Yeah. I'm gonna add in some drum machine noises too to that initial rhythm. Put it behind stuff. Maybe layer my original beep up. Something. I think I'll give us a little Flippy. symmetry. doesn't happen. We no. just do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see this point eight. Oh, I don't want to write another error. Oh, and I'm going to. All right. I know how to write code, I swear to God. They pay me money to do this. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to do this every third frame plus one frame, so I know it'll be offset from the other one. What were you going to say? So another thing I end up doing is um, I always speed up 
my um, sound because usually we're at an outer rave and we want people to dance. <laughs> um, so sometimes, let, well, it used to be I used to like kind of like tell, like try to n nod to Sarah, like I'm gonna speed up, but I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm doing this. Um, so usually, I, yeah, just speed things up a little bit to start. second SVG. Right now we've all been looking at one single SVG, but I have the secret second SVG, and that I can use blend modes to share with the other SVG. So now I have this rectangle that um, I think it's different right now. I don't know, it's pretty dark. It might not be. That's going over this to sort of create more effects. So I've got two of these cool rectangles moving around, and I'm like, ugh, what's this mode? Is that what I want? Oh, it's luminosity. That's why it's weird. So I can come over here, and I can be like, sometimes luminosity, sometimes difference, to add different elements. So because I'm writing all of this while you're sitting here, and usually we're playing for longer, so I'm adding other shapes and more is going on, being able to have other ways to use rhythm to rotate through what's going on can be an effective way to give texture and change and difference to the picture where it's not just you watching me be like, which shapes do I like to draw? Um, although I do also have something I'm a big fan of is I created a shape, a shape deformer. So I can draw this shape thing here, but then instead of, um, here, what color are we gonna make this next shape? Uh, let's make it bright orange. Um, I can just, I think I already defined a deformed shape above, so let's see if that still works. Yeah, you can tell it's defined because it's auto-completing. A shape, so a circle, these are with the SVG API, so circles and rectangles, I can just say where to draw them. The uh, polygons, I draw, and then I have to translate them. So we're going to translate it like, I don't know, 20 view width and let's say 40 view height. Um, so that's the viewport width and height. Um, using web stuff is great because they've done a lot of work for me. And let's just say every, when you're listening to the sound, we'll add the deformed shape every fifth frame. See how it comes out? Oh yeah, it looks great. Um, but it's a solid shape. Maybe I want it to be a weirder shape. So instead of just plain bright orange, I can do something where I have a function called pattern. And using closure script, I can just use the ID for that, for bright orange lines, and that'll tell it where to find the pattern. Um, maybe it needs to be lines five. Oh yeah, there we go, we've got bright orange lines. We can make them five. There we go. And every time I save, the deformed shape changes because, I mean, I can save that in a variable where it won't change every time, but it's fun to change it every time because, again, it just adds, like, more dynamicism that I don't have to think really hard about. So that got um, a little darker, which wasn't my intention. I was actually trying to, like, <laughs> but this is live coding. So I was actually like, oh, there's a lot of bright green. I want to add this like um, this Roland synthy sound to see if I can get because it does this like doo -loo -loo, doo -loo -loo sound, but it didn't work. <laughs> oh, that's not it. But maybe if I get rid of some of my other samples, it does go with the weird dark colors that I've got going on in here though. And maybe I'll stop my swishy loop. Yeah, it, yeah, I was going for the dark colors. Exactly. It was all on purpose. The worms and the doo 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 are very technical terms. <laughs> um, and this is again just making use of like all of the things that SVGs make it fairly simple to do. So these are outlines of shapes, these worms, and then you can 
Um, in SVG, when you draw a stroke, you can make it a dotted line. And this is an animated dotted line, but it's describing a fun shape. And so I've got these worms. I've got some other fun shapes I can describe. I think I've got one. Let's see what this one is. LLM. I don't usually put a one. What's that going to be? Nope. Oh, yeah. So we can see here now there's this like little lariat. That's another vector I've defined and put a dotted line on and then used animations to animate through. Um, getting sick of these dark guys. So I can just come in and comment them out. This has another fun thing that I've made. What's this one going to be? I think these are bubbles. Yeah, there we go. And so this is sort of our like standard performance that we've done. If I just use La Habra, we can change it, build up more, get crazy. But because I started having fun with um, synthesizers and emulators, now sometimes I use my analog synthesizer and so I'll run this in and start changing what's going on. But something else that I can do just on my computer, um, and thank God for faster chips because I used to have to have two computers to make this possible. Um, you guys might know about VDMX, right? Um, you guys had a workshop on it. And something that's really fun about VDMX is that you can make an input a window. So here we see that I want to make this. Oh, it still says it's already the electron, so I just need to turn it on. There you go. So now this isn't VDMX. But something fun you might know about VDMX is it does siphon in and siphon out. Well, signal culture makes apps that want siphon in and send siphon out.
German keyboard now, so I like have to remember where all the keys are. Very exciting. <laughs> you know, I want to make it harder. <laughs> I brought that beat back in that I started with. Eventually that will go, that will be what we end with. Right, so I'm just sort of frantically taking things away while also trying to keep it looking nice. Um, <laughs> it's quartzy, yeah. I'm feeling really quartzy. <laughs> and so eventually, we get rid of everything but the circle again, and it's a little bit faster. I'm gonna leave that lariat because I yeah. think it's funny. But usually, then we look at each other and we're like, "Cool, uh, good job." And we hit stop. And we did not rehearse this at all. I I feel like it's a sign we've worked together so long that we can pretty much know when the next person wants to talk or finish each other's sentences. <laughs> Sure, yeah. So you mentioned it yesterday and you did it today. There's like this sort of the improvisational arc of like you go get complex and then come back down again. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried to not do that and ever have it work? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of other ways we've, like this is our standard. What other ways have we? We finish in chaos sometimes. Oh yeah, sometimes we're like, let's fuck this up and like see if we can break it. <laughs> um, or just make a complete mess and then leave it and just sh like shut the laptop. <laughs> and it doesn't always have to be like a single arc. It can be up and down or like we've changed what's going on. I, I try to focus a lot on, yeah, the next step seeming not shocking from what was there before. So sometimes I'll hate something, but spend five minutes getting rid of it because I want to like add something else that's interesting so then you don't notice when I take the bad thing away. It's not just like, I did it exciting and then it changed again. Like I'm like, look over there, look over there, look over there. Okay, get rid of that. I think what we don't do, or at least not in a performance, is started with like chaos and decomposed. <laughs> we haven't tried th that, at least not live. I don't know if we've done that in a Sunday session. I don't, no. It's just not, I don't know, we always kind of start from scratch, but that's kind of part of getting into it. Yeah, and I feel like us. it's like honoring the live, like I think we both originally came from places where live code was start, start with scratch. a blank screen, so we're used to that. Um, that's not always the case, so we could try it someday, that'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions? Yeah. Lawrence Shea, everyone. Hi, that was really fun. Um, it, it's, a lot of the pleasure was your narration of the and watching what you were doing. So, in your with your is your audience often sort of they know what you don't have to narrate it because they they're kind of following both and and that their their aesthetic pleasure comes from seeing your the you, both aspects of what you're doing. I think so. Like, um, there's been like very minimal research on this, but um, <laughs> someone did write a paper about live code audiences. Um, their hypothesis was they're mostly programmers who would get a kick out of this, um, but actually what they found was um, everyone kind of likes the demystifying of the process and actually more people than they thought weren't coders in the audience. Actually more people were there for electronic music. Um, so yeah, so but, but everyone really does appreciate that like seeing of the process and that became yeah, I mean the original, <laughs> I, the original like joke people say about live coders showing their screens was that um, they were computer, you know, laptop musicians, and they didn't want people to think they were just checking their email. <laughs> so they, were <laughs> so they started showing their screens, right? Um, <laughs> but it, it, yeah, it's that transparency and that like process art that kind of draws us in, I think. Yeah, and for me, it's actually become a big tension in my own work that there's not usually enough projectors um, to send out 
So as I do more code and I end up sending it through VDMX and screwing it up more, um, it's harder to keep the code on the screen because I want to be able to use the whole screen for the image and show that. Um, and there's just the tension too between when you make something that people hear, them reading the code and listening are different senses when it's things that people are looking at, right? You always have that problem where you're like, well, don't read the code. I want you to just like give yourself over to the pictures. Um, so when I, I don't show my code as much anymore, which I think is a shame in a lot of cases. And in a perfect world, I would have another, I would just have another projector so that people could see the code, but it didn't interfere with the text. Um, Olivia clearly with Hydra took like a, the other approach where you can put the code over the image, which is sometimes good, but sometimes it means when you apply all the effects then you can't read your code anymore, which is a very fun um, predicament to get yourself into. So I think it's, yeah, it's something I think about a lot and kind of work around on with how much I want people to see it and how much I want them to just like enjoy the vibe. You should, you, we should, you know, there's this, there's this really nice material called textiline, which is like a screen material. And so we use it often to have like an image in front of a performer. And then you have light on the performer, so you can still see them. But then you can, you can project your code in front of you, and you could be like in the, in the code. That yeah. sounds really cool, yeah. Yeah, like, like a shark's tooth mesh, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a performer, Renick Bell, who did a lot of performances like that, like kind of like in the middle of a cube of his own code, and it's all in black and white. He's like very dramatic, so it's all like very, <laughs> it's very intense. He is also colorblind. I forgot. Yeah. I forgot about that. It's but all dramatic to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and it's also just lawn chair material. It's the secret <laughs> of textiline. Yeah. <laughs> Coming to you, Will. Is, honestly, is there anything that wrong with just someone checking their emails the entire time? <laughs> I mean, if it sounds good, it's like, ah, you do whatever you want, yeah. Sure, but then it's not like then it's not a, a, a process art performance. Then it's pressing play. Dig. And that's like a different kind of thing. <laughs> um. Um, I'm curious, like, what your art and music background was like before this, and like how that influences how you think about. Um, like live coding performance, like you talked about a little bit, with like trying to make it like a, like with dance, uh, and so, yeah, I was just uh, curious about that. Yeah, um, I'm not a sound person. <laughs> I'm I'm a dancer, so like through that, I have a very different, I guess, understanding of of sound. Um, and that I'm yeah more interested in how it it sh yeah works with an image, I guess, and that, I guess that comes from being a choreographer. Sound is about yeah filling a space and um, and yeah, sort of, yeah, going with a theme or something rather than like it being a medium on its own. Like I d I've never, maybe once or twice, I've just performed sound by myself, but not, I don't know. <laughs> it's like not my normal thing, yeah. <laughs> this is like not even occurred to me until this moment, but we are a band of two people who are not sound people. Yeah, our sound pe person left us. <laughs> Well, we started just we started the two of the us, and then for a while we performed with a third person who was more of a music person, and we've gone back to the two of us now, just as life changes, but um, I think it's still pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, multiple. I'm just gonna go to Heather. Since you do have a movement practice, have you tried to use movement in these, these performances, and uh, do you have any stories from that attempt, if so? No, we so we've um, we've written proposals to do this with um, <laughs> with dancers, but um, it's never worked out. So we haven't actually done that yet. Um, yeah, yeah, we haven't we haven't done that with this yet. Um, yeah, the only movement practice was handing um, a thumb drive back and forth. Oh yeah, so yeah, <laughs> we when when Melody performed with us. The w we did this like wild thing in the beginning where she would live sample the output from my computer um, and then like mess with it and then we'd put that sample back in. Um, and we like did various ways of actually collaborating on the sound in performance over the years. But the first way was she would just like, if Wi-Fi wasn't working, um, first of all, if Wi-Fi was working, we'd use like Dropbox. 
<laughs> and then it became just like a thumb drive back and forth if we couldn't get one Wi-Fi. Um, and then eventually like all these like, you know, web editors became um, better for collaborating. So we um, eventually used something called Troop um, as a way of um, collaborating on the same piece of code together. But yeah, at first we were like, <laughs> Yeah, in a dark club, handing a thumb drive back and forth. That was great. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I, um, I was curious about the specific visuals that you're choosing. Um, uh, do they sometimes turn out so arbitrary that you don't like them? Or, you know, I know that y you told that you do have some preset shapes or some visuals already prepared. So is that something you, you know, chose from seeing previous artwork? Just, you know, like, what's the choice in like that visual process? Yeah, so I've always been like a huge fan of flat geometric shapes, um, just aesthetically kind of forever. And because of the, I think, Southern California influence. Like I recently went home and saw my family and it was very funny driving around when I was like, oh, it's not even just the 90s-ishness of it. There's something about like the like flat advertising-y overload that just makes sense to me as a thing that I'm like, yes, this is how the world looks. And so I know that I like that. And then the tools that I use make doing work like that easy. And so I chose those tools because I know, you know, as it's very hard or it's reasonably hard, I think, to make geometric shapes that you can control in shaders, you know, like because it's a different way of looking at shapes. But in SVG, you're just like, draw this vector line. Now it's a pentagon. Um, and I knew from other work I had done that it was reasonably easy to make patterned textures. So I didn't do as much of the patterns as I often always do, but there's a way in SVGs to repeat that, and I knew that from other projects. So when I decided to develop this, I did very specifically choose to use SVGs because I knew they would do what I wanted. Um, and then this has guide ra rails for me in it too that helps, like the colors all go together, and people are like, oh, how do you pick that? But it's like, because I have a file called palette and I named all the colors, right? And I've done shows where I picked other palettes for different people I was playing with, but I tried to make those constraints so that, because there's so much other stuff I can screw up that like sort of narrowing the things I can screw up is helpful. It's like having a media bin. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I've learned a, about like a built-in human brain function that is audio-visual synchronization. So, uh, it basically says that whether or not the audio and visual are synchronized, your, your brain will make you think that it's synchronized. So I'm wondering whether you will heavily rely on that or will you try, still try to make it like synchronized, like to catch, catch the visuals to that beat? Yeah, so we pretty much entirely rely <laughs> on your brain because here's the thing. <laughs> I don't care how expensive or big a computer is, and I'm not always the biggest fan of the like brain computer metaphor, but in this specific case, your brain is a much better computer than anything we could buy, so we're gonna rely on your brain to sync it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a, um, I collaborate a lot with um, another live coder, Alex McLean, and we have this, um, we had this project where the first iteration, we had this like really like, um, big plan where like he was gonna live code this music and I was actually performing I was dancing and like I was gonna hear a change in the music and change to like the next part of the score that I was gonna do and then he would see me change um, and like change something in the music and it didn't work at all because <laughs> we were too busy like focusing on what we were doing so we told the computer to do it so the computer would go to my next part of the score if it heard his part change so like there like there's definitely times when I'm like yes the computer should be listening and doing the changing of the, of the visual for me because <laughs> I'm busy doing something else. <laughs> so it's not, um, so I've definitely used that kind of like sound analysis in performance, um, but as a way more as a way to offload a task. <laughs> okay, any burning questions? Otherwise, I'm going to pivot us to playtime. So on our schedule, we have an hour of playtime, um, and you know, 
we have many experts in the room if you, if you want to work on some things. Um, any burning instructions from our teachers? Do your homework, says Shar. Do your freaking homework. Um, but I also want to just take a moment in case anyone sneaks out within this time to thank our wonderful instructors. They did an incredible job of fitting a lot of information in this time, and I'm so amazed that we're on time. I mean, the pizza was late, but we weren't, you know? So um, yeah, and there probably is still pizza, so feel free to eat it. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep the doors open for a while, um, but you know, keep playing, do your homework. Um, and can thank I say you. one more thing? You can say as much as you want, Sarah. I have, so two more people to thank. Obviously, thank you guys for having us at the studio. It's a bunch of work to like admin and organize all of this. And then finally, thank you students. You guys have been like, there's been such a long day and so much to do. Um, and you guys have come along. Like Without you, we'd just be talking to ourselves in an empty room, so thanks. Seriously. Yeah, and thank you for coming to Art and & Code. And I really hope Pittsburgh you know, continues to be a hotbed of pixels and waves and stuff like that. And don't worry, I, I'll keep fostering um, community here. And also, you can you can throw a party too. Um, and and I'll come. Yeah, cool. Thank you.